Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the November 18th, 2019, Group Unified School District Board of Education meeting. Roll call, please. Here. 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 Thank you. Uh, Mayor Berkson, may I ask you to lead us in the flag salute? And before everyone sits down, if you'd please uh, remain standing, we have a moment of silence. three here so please bear with me um, the Board of Education would like to hold a moment of silence for mrs. Katie Muneer a retired employee who passed away on October 24th mrs. Muneer was employed from 1969 to 2003 as an instructional aide for 20 years and then a clerk typist for 14 years she retired in 2003 after 34 years of service to group unified I'd also like to hold a moment of silence for Mr. Gary, Coach Peterson, students called him Coach, retired teacher who passed away on November 5th. He was hired in 1967 as a PE and math teacher, first at Hoopa Middle and then at Mariloma Middle. He retired in 2001 after 34 years of teaching Hoopa students. Finally, uh, hold a moment of silence for Ms. Sharon McAleah retired bus driver who passed away on November 12th. She worked as a bus driver from 1966 to 1997 when she retired. The board would like to express their condolences to their families. Thank you, please be seated. Mrs. Regal, inspirational comment. Thank you. Um, thanks for signing me up on this one. I was a little um, stuck on what to cover tonight and could have gone with the whole cliche with the holidays and thinking of Thanksgiving. And um, of course, I'm very grateful. But uh, I'm going to jump into something a little different here. Um, something that I learned recently that especially in our work environment we are covered with so many tasks and and finding the time to prioritize or that one task that we always go I'm gonna do that tomorrow and we say that for a week I, I know I'm guilty about that so um, something recently I learned uh, with a class I'm taking um, it was a quote from Mark Twain uh, Mark Twain and it is the um, his quote was, eat a live frog first thing in the morning and nothing worse will happen to the day. And what he's really saying is like, that's, that's our priority. And um, hopefully this can inspire us to really look at your day and eat that frog. Um, just as a quote, I don't know if anybody likes frog legs or anything like that, but really, this is really, um, I'm being serious. Um, and if you really have multiple tasks that we're all dreading, I know we've, we're guilty of that. And um, it says if you have to eat two frogs, eat the ugliest one first. And so you take that as your, your task or your priority and, um, and eat the frog. Let's get our priorities in order and, and you know, go through with those tasks. And, and it's something that I've been carrying mentally with myself every day and really have seen that a difference in, the, in what I'm doing and really eating that frog. So that's what I have for you today. Thank you, Mrs. Regal. All right, uh, reports from closed session. Mr. Brooks. In a vote of five to zero with all trustees in favor and none opposed, the board voted not to petition the California Supreme Court for review of case number E071552. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brooks. 
Now on to item 1A. Welcome 2019-2020 student board members. Mr. Duchon. Thank you, President Garcia. Welcome, gentlemen, tonight. Um, why don't we start with Harupa Valley? And you are also going to read, Darian, I believe, the report from um, Rubido. So why don't you do both of them, and then we'll go to Miguel for Patriot High School. And again, thank you both for, for being here. Um, good evening, everyone. As you all may know, we recently had our first annual Community of Communities Fall Parade on November 2nd. The parade started at Herpa Valley High School, and it was fun getting so many people involved in the parade. We had our band, cheer, FFA, and our volunteer group involved, and it went incredibly smooth. Our improv team had their second improv, team, improv show this year on Friday, November 1st. It was at 3 p.m., and tickets were just $3. Theaters sold slushies before the show to raise money for all of their future, future events. This show is very last minute, but I attended, and it went very smooth, and they had me laughing the whole way through. Fall sports have officially finished their games and did incredibly well. Football finished off 4-6, to six, which is exceptional for Upper Valley High School and a huge accomplishment. Girls volleyball finished off 6-4 to four and got third place in the league. Our girls golf team had one girl, Dakota Warren, finished in seventh place and made all league. Our boys water polo team finished third place and will play the, well, last but not least, girls tennis finished first place in the league and play CIF this week. Halloween was a very busy day for ASB and seniors on campus. Seniors had their Costbuster celebration and college kickoff day in the gym first through fourth period. There was breakfast, which included muffins, Chick-fil-A sandwiches, and fruit. Board games were available and tons of raffles. ASB helped with music, popping popcorn, and helping them get started with the day. On Halloween, ASB also hosted a Halloween costume contest in the quad. We had prizes for the best group, best overalls boys costume, best overalls girls costume, and for our runner-ups. We also handed out candy at lunch for those who were dressed up for Halloween. 12 Angry Jurors is the newest play coming to JVHS. Theater is having this play this week. First one is Wednesday, November 20th at 3 p.m. The second one is on Thursday, November 21st at 6 p.m. And the third one is on Friday, November 22nd at 6 p.m. too. The tickets are $3 pre-sale and $5 at the door. One murder, two hours, 12 people. Come out and support. We are having our JUSD, ho JUSD holiday food drive November 13th through December 11th at our school. All students can donate non-perishable food items, new or gently used clothes, toys, or household items. It's open to every family in our JUSD community. Our boys for our city basketball team are competing in our annual tip-off tournament this week. The games are this Tuesday and Wednesday at 7 p.m. and Friday and Saturday, but the times will be determined. Admission is $5 and is located in our gym. Thank you, guys. Rubio, yeah, go ahead. Um, good evening, district members. I hope you all had a great weekend and have a great week. It's been busy and a tough month for Rubido High School. Girls tennis ended their season together at CIF round three, but single individuals are still going. We are proud to say that all of our fall sports have come to an end. Today, winter sports officially start league. Wrestling has a match today at Rubido Valley, as well as girls freshman basketball has a game at Rialto away. Upcoming events are we are planning is out winter ball. The student body ASB has decided as a whole class that the theme is going to be an Egyptian black light. We are excited to make a rally out of this theme because it is something that we've never done before. Tomorrow, Tuesday, November 19th, our boys basketball will be having a game at our gym starting at 3 a.m. or p.m. Last Friday, two members of our associated student body planned a kind attack where we choose teachers and surprise them by filling their rooms with balloon posters and all kinds of positive messages to let them know that we appreciate them. Students come at 5 to 6 a.m. to show up before the teacher and fill the whole room up so that it's the first thing they see when they wake up. On November 10th, Veterans Day, our associated student body government went to a CADA conference in the Disneyland Hotel. The CADA Castle Conference stands for California Associated Student Leaders. The conference gives our student leaders opportunities to learn and create a positive and welcoming environment to take back to our school. That is all I have for you today. Thank you. Um, thank you, Harupa Valley High School and Rubidoux High School. Great job. We will report at the next meeting that you did a very good job and represented Rubidoux very well. <laughs> Miguel, would you like to 
inform us and enlighten us about Patriot High School. Sure. So good evening, everyone. I hope everyone had a great weekend. So Patriot has a lot of uh, fun events coming up. Uh, but first, I would like to acknowledge that um, so a few weeks ago, there were obviously those fires, um, and we were supposed to have a fall festival that week. But we instead, our high school is a um, Red Cross evacuation center. And I just want to say that I'm proud to be a Patriot warrior in the sense that our student body came together to help out when or with the evacuation protocol getting everything set up making sure everyone had water um, passing out meals and i just want to say i'm proud of my student body um, that they could all come together without anybody even asking them just want them wanting to do it on their own volition i just think that is amazing that students have that power and just So um, moving on from that, <laughs> um, our theater program just wrapped up production on their play, Check Please. It's about a speed dating service in a cafe. Um, it's a comedy. It was pretty great. Um, on Tuesday, UCR is partnering with the Patriot Science Department to present a Night of Science, which takes place on, the cam or on campus from 6 to 8 and they're showcasing different experiments and they're gonna have telescopes set up, um, just generally getting uh, students in the community involved in an interest in science. Um, let's see. The College and Career Center is also hosting a parent session on November 20th, 6 to 8 p.m., which just informs um, parents on the school system and how to really get involved in their uh, child's education, which I always find is important, um, opens up different resources for parents, um, lets them know about opportunities coming up. After that, we have a our Silent Night Carnival and basketball game on November 13th. Actually, no, that should be December 13th. Sorry about that. Um, so we had it last year, and it was a big, it was a big hit. Everybody loved it, and it increased our attendance at the basketball game immensely. We had the entire home side of our gym filled and this year we're making it bigger. We're using an entire hallway instead of just half and we're opening it um, up to the community more, getting more community advertisements out there. So maybe you'll see our advertisements in Starbucks pretty soon. Um, we are going to be playing, or games, <laughs> ASB will be playing games for prizes. Um, pretty great prizes. We have a little coffee pack that I made, which was great. Um, so it's also against Rubido, which is a pretty big deal, them being our main rivals. So we are hoping to have our home side and our visitor side and also people standing outside. We hope to really sell out. Um, our winter rally is also coming up on January 30th. The theme is, no, er, yeah, is uh, Nightmare After Christmas. Um, thought that was a little funny one. <laughs> um, and that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, on to number two, 2A, recognition of JUSD staff by Mayor Berkson. Mr. Duchon. Some of you may have attended the um, Oscar-winning um, film of Dirty Jobs in Harupa, and uh, Mayor Berkson did a tour of the dirtiest of the dirty jobs. I really don't think ours was the dirtiest. Maybe it was the most fun, and I don't know whether you were fed at the end of it or not, but I would really welcome, like to welcome Mayor Berkson, who I believe is going to recognize some of the uh, main stars of that show. Mr. Mayor, is the microphone on? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's on. Yeah. I thought I had a loud enough voice. Um, we'll uh, show the video, then I'll I'll say a few words about it, and that way it gets people kind of energized. We're just showing the JUSD segment. Don't worry, it's not. Okay, I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> this will just be about a, a two-minute video, so I'll, I'll come back okay. up when this. Hi, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for coming. We have a lot for you to do, so go ahead and hop right in there in the kitchen. Okay. And then when you're finished, come right out here to the cafeteria and start cleaning up some tables. Okay. You ready? Absolutely. Let's get to it. Okay. A lot of trash, okay? Yeah, let's okay. let's go do that. crazy notion, I don't know, many months ago that said I should do this dirty jobs thing and not just highlight um, the, the, the men and women that work in our agencies, the local agencies that bring services to our 108,000 residents every single day, uh, but rather showcase not the cashier at the, at the window that just, you know, has the easy job of writing papers back and forth. We're talking about the people that actually get dirty um, and and that's their life day in and day out and they smile all the time so um, really without further ado the, the stars of this show are not me of course they are the people that work for the school district and our other agencies this was one of 11 segments in total which is why you're fortunate not having to sit through the whole thing um, I know Elliot had to be tortured with that because I made him I made him stay till the end <laughs> Uh, so without further ado, let me go ahead and provide the certificates to those who honestly deserve them more than anybody. I'm going to start off, and you can all come up, and we'll uh, you can all come up when I call your name. So Robert Kemlick, Robert helped Robert helped create and, and orchestrate the uh, the events that, that took place at Harupa Middle School. Uh, next we have Betty Sotomayor. Thirdly, Monica Montiel Turner, the principal. <laughs> Sally Release. Release. <laughs> and Candy Acosta, who is not here tonight. Um, <clears throat> and I'll read the uh, certificate to you so you know what it says. It says, the City of Harupa Valley is pleased to recognize you for your participation in the 2019 Dirty Jobs State of the City video. It was a night to come together as a community and to showcase the important work you perform daily to provide the vital services to the residents of Harupa Valley, both on a local and regional level. You are truly valued as you perform such important and often unseen jobs that are central to the services we provide in our community. Whether it be paving roads, improving community parks, finding homes for sheltered animals, delivering emergency services, or creating safe neighborhoods, we are working together for a better future. Thank you for representing the best of Peru Valley, signed uh, December, uh, October 10th, 2019, by the mayor himself. Thank you all for everything you do. provide 
provide these to, we can get this to, to Candy. We'll give you that one. Thank you to the board, by the way, for allowing me to to allow your uh, staff to participate in this. I think it it proves one thing: we know we're a community of communities. But I came up with another thing: we're also an agency among other agencies. We all work together. It was shown. I'm not going to bore you with more praise than you deserve. But the fire, the evacuation center, the parade, all the things that we do, we do together as a team. And this was just one more thing to put it together. So thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you for that, Mr. Mayor, and thank you to the recipients, the recognizees, and for all your hard work and, and helping the, the city of Fruitvale Valley with that. So moving on, uh, 2B, recognize funding for 2019-2020 Agricultural Career Technical Education Incentive Grant. Mr. Dabrowski. Thank you. The CDE recently notified us that funding for the 2019-20 Agricultural Career Technical Education Incentive Grant has been awarded in the amount of $13,464. Thank you. All right. Item number three, board comments. Ms. Ortega, start with you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I want to say thank you to the students. Uh, we're always well informed because of you, so thank you, Miguel. And I totally agree with you. I uh, went to Patriot to the evacuation center, and I saw you students just love on each other and love on on our community, and it's just really admirable on on your behalf of you know you young ones teaching us the the older ones how it's really done. So thank you for that as well. Um, I saw city officials there. I um, was speaking to one of one of the the Red Cross individuals and she said she said two things to me she said they, that they never seen a evacuation center where they don't separate animals from their owners because we don't think that animals also get traumatized of you know what's going on so that we were one of the few centers or the first one that they seen that the, the animals are not separated from their owners so I was like wow that's amazing and also how engaged the students were. Um, and so uh, Pico was there, so the, their, their employees were there uh, playing Play-Doh with the kids. And it was just really amazing to see also all of our staff there and you know, any information that, that you guys got were just always um, communicating to, to our community. So I think that was really amazing and uh, bravery and again, warriors, really warriors that, that came together and, and offered support to the most needed. Um, so I'm very proud as well to be part of this community and communities of communities. And I agree with you, Mayor, it's agencies um, connecting with other agencies to really bring that healing and that support that our community needs in the most needing times. So thank you for that. Um, and just quickly, two events that I'll have coming up this this week is uh, BK graduations. It's always really nice to see the parents get really involved. I think that's amazing too. We can't do none of this work without parents as well. So we'll be participating in that this week. And as well, West Riverside, as a graduate of West Riverside, I'm very proud to go back to my roots and um, we'll have a ri ribbon cutting and a dedication to Admiral, Admiral Hill that we had um, uh, had a dedication uh, or recognition for him here um, earlier last year. So I'm excited for those events and um, I'll leave the rest for later. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ortega. Mrs. Bradford. To our students. I'd like to say, remind you of the uh, quote by Mahatka, Mahatma Gandhi that says, be the change you want to see in the world. So I'm, I'm pleased to see you modeling that for not only our students, but our community. Thank you. 
Um, for myself personally, what I've done since the last meeting is I attended the Think Together After School program open house at Stone Avenue, and I was very pleased to see the loving care that the program leadership offers to the students who are there in the after school care. And I saw some of the uh, parents picking up their students and, and, and how much the, the kids, the affection that they had when they said goodbye to, to the staff workers there. And it made me very proud of, of the staff taking care of our children after school. And, and they said that sometimes they, they spend a lot of time there for, based on the parents' needs. Um, I attended the community discussion regarding the potential bond measure uh, to improve our school physical needs that you'll hear about later. And uh, let's see, I attended the annual joint meeting of the Riverside San Bernardino uh, County School Districts. I was nominated by our district to serve as its uh, representative and was elected to uh, serve on the committee that offers opinions and, and judgments on district-wide school decisions. And additionally, Trustee Ragel and I attended a workshop sponsored by the California School Board Association regarding uh, more details of, of the Brown Act so that we conduct ourselves properly in public and in private um, regarding agendized meetings. And that is it for me right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Bradford. Mrs. Chart. Um, well, I would want to extend my condolences to the families of our former employees that uh, we honored tonight. Um, I knew Ms. Muneer, and she was a great person. She was a really sweet lady. And to stay in the district as long as she did, I believe she even graduated from Rubido High School, if I'm not mistaken. But um, she'd grown up in the communities, and a lot of the kids, a lot of people around here probably even remember her. Um, the others I did not know. Uh, I want to thank Ms. Mayor Ber Berkson uh, for having the foresight to create a fabulous video. I was there that night, and I saw it. And it really was a great, great thing to see our mayor get down and dirty and do all that. So you didn't see the jobs he did on this one. This one's not as bad. I saw some of the others. He went down and he did a great job, but he also honored a lot of our community people who don't get honored as well as often as we would like to. And, and like you said, you know, we are a community and we are um, a, an organization that we all have to work together. And our community does come together. It was so shown so well when we had the fires on Wednesday, um, we had a fire out by Granite Hill. And a lot of times you don't see the news people commenting on anybody but maybe the firemen or the policemen. But they commented on our sheriffs from Harupa, from our school district. They showed our buses. They showed that the school district had just sent the buses out to load these people up to take them to the evacuation center. And that and the city was there. That community members from the city were there helping, trying to drive people there. This was a situation that you don't always see, you know, see people driving away and they all cause roadblocks. But our our uh, situation out there was well organized with our buses, with the police, the sheriffs, the community members, and Patriot. School district did a great job with Patriot um, having them for an evacuation day on Wednesday and then turned around and had to do it Thursday morning again with the fires. I was in the evacuation zone. I saw those fires and it is a scary sight. It didn't get close to my house, but I do have friends that it got close to theirs. They were evacuated from their home and sent to Patriot, and they said Patriot was wonderful. They just appreciated so much the way the students just took them in. And, you know, I mean, Red Cross does that, but you guys just did a great job. I mean, I heard that from people, and a lot of those people go to Rubido. So, you know, they're, they appreciate it. I wish there was some way we could really show the appreciation to everybody that works so hard on this because it was well organized and people it just, you know, we all came together in a bad situation and turned out, made it turn out not so bad. So um, I also went to Ein Arbuckle's um, Fall Festival on November 7th and um, was had an opportunity to walk around the campus a little bit and saw where the portables, I'd been on Dr. Hansen about getting those portables painted to make it look something like the rest of the school and they look great. It, it, was, it looks wonderful. I know it's been done for a while, but I hadn't been down there to see it. And the students have planted a garden. We're getting plants in there, so it's coming together. Um, this is the right time of year, I think, to plant um, things like that. And uh, it just looks great. And the kids were having a ball down there. So um, 
I also that evening, um, uh, Mrs. Ragel and um, Mr. Brooks and Mr. Dobrowski and I attended the RCC President's Dinner um, where they um, honor their alumni, the cho choose the alumni that um, they want to put in their Hall of Fame. And we've had a couple of people from our district that are in that Hall of Fame. Um, but it was really an enjoyable time. We were entertained by the RCC chamber singers and then also um, we were entertained by the RCC jazz band and they did a great job. And we know some of our students from our area out here are in that band. Um, we just didn't know which ones. Um, but it was an enjoyable time to go. I hadn't been to one of those before. Um, and then on Tuesday the 12th, um, Riverside County Office of Education sponsors an operation recognition for along with the Veterans Affairs of Riverside Office and they honor veterans who had to leave school for whatever reason, whether it was because they were drafted to go into the military and didn't get to finish their, college, their high school education and um, they award them diplomas if the families so wish to. I was there with my mother um, to receive my father's diploma. He would have graduated from Poly High School, but he left the 11th at the end of his 11th grade to join the Navy. We don't really know why, whether he wasn't that interested in school or whether he uh, just wanted to serve his country, but I believe that he learned a lot from the military being there. He came back, ran a business, never got his college or his high school diploma, so it was quite an honor for us and quite a ceremony. Um, we uh, were entertained by King High School uh, chamber singers and then the ROTC from Elson, Lake Elsinore High School came out and did a uh, presentation and retirement of the American flag um, to oh, the song has escaped me now sorry um, no it wasn't taps it's one of the um, it's a country song country singer sings it um, but it was great it was a fabulous uh, program and ceremony and then they honored the veterans there were five other veterans there um, there were six being honored but only five of them showed up besides my dad uh, for my dad and they gave us a hat the, uh, and they gave a, a cowl to wear um, that says that they graduated and then a diploma um, from the from Riverside County High School is what they call it. So if you know of a veteran that has did not graduate from high school, they had um, two from the Vietnam War, two from uh, World War II, three from World War II there that day. So um, and from all different military parts, the Navy and um, Marines and Army also. So, um, But I thank them for that. It was quite an honor. A little mo emotional too. Um, I think that's all that I have for right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Chard. Mrs. Regal. Thank you. Um, I won't repeat, but as, as you guys, thanks for bringing it up that I was in attendance with some of the things over the past couple of weeks, but um, I want to also um, thank you, Daniel Gwen. I went to Camino Real and read to his fourth grade students. Um, I brought one of my children's favorite books. We would always read uh, Magic Treehouse books, so I took one down there, and some of the students were familiar with the books, but it was nice to introduce the students that had not been familiar and, and kind of start them off on a, um, a little adventure by reading a couple of chapters. And then, um, Dr. Hansen, I want to thank you as, as we approach this decision for the bond, but you took a quite a bit of time out of your day to tour these campuses that have had the improvements overall, as well as the ones that need the improvement. Um, I know it was just absolutely stunning. And, um, you know, I just, your work is, you're very talented and you, you did a great job of putting this all together, but I know it's just an absolutely beautiful campus. And I know West Riverside's coming along and look forward to seeing that at completion. I also want to thank all of the staff and, and the students that really jumped in um, at the time of need when we when our city had a fire. Um, you know, there's there's our first responders and and as several of you had mentioned that the students just jumped in and volunteered, but also the, the staff. I mean, we have a lot to consider when there's when our city's at threat and you, you have your family, you have your home, and, and um, some people really, you know, had to 
jump in and make sure the schools and their students were the first priority. So I really want to thank you all for jumping in and, and the campuses that had to bring on these additional students. Um, thank you for quickly jumping the guns. Monica, JMS, I know that you had to quickly absorb students from, was it Granite Hill? And so I want to thank you all for, for really jumping in and um, putting together at the time that our city was in need to take care of each other. And then also the coordination of the parade. Um, our city, that's our first uh, parade that we've had in many years in bringing in our students, the marching bands and the, and the cheerleaders and other participants. So um, I didn't, wasn't able to attend, but I want to thank the city and um, hopefully all the students really enjoyed that and look forward to participating again next year. That's all I have today. Thank you, Mrs. Riegel. Well, I won't repeat all of that. I think uh, we're all very proud of our, our staff here at Rupa, And I uh, just wanted to add that uh, some of our staff members either got up early or went home late. And so I really want to thank them all for every little part they did was big part, small part. It's all important. Miguel, please make sure you let your fellow students know that um, we're all very proud of them and thank them for, for, uh, for doing what they do. And last thing I wanted to say, October 26th, I had an opportunity to, to visit Mission Middle School. There was a health fair there, and uh, the Lions Club is part of, of that every year. Um, so the, I want to thank Mr. Chavez, Mr. Mr. Jose Campos first. I just happened to be looking at Mr. Chavez. Uh, Mr. Jose Campos, uh, Director of Parent Involvement Community Outreach, who puts this together every year, uh, health fair, and uh, and always invites the Lions Club to come out. And uh, it's not actually the Lions Club; it's a uh, uh, it's a group run by Lions called uh, Lions Friends in Sight. They usually give away up to 300 pair of glasses. Uh, there's no income verification. Anybody who shows up gets a pair. So uh, next year, keep a, keep an eye out for that, and so you can invite some of your students. And that's all I have for tonight. So moving on to item number four: public verbal comments. First one I have here. Is Mrs. Sylvia Olguin. I have both positive and negative for you. Um, I agree. I would like to thank Trent. Um, whenever I make calls to him on behalf of either parents or situations at site, he is prompt in returning my calls with positive results. And I really want to thank you for all your hard work. I think you put a lot of energy and heart into your job. So thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Ragu, I don't want to mis-enunciate your name. I don't know your reasoning, and I don't need to know that. I don't think any of us need to know why you didn't vote uh, for a raise that should have not been given, but I thank you for that. You have your own reasons, and I respect that. But unknown to you, it meant a lot to classified and certificated employees. Um, we're often told how great we are once a year. We're recognized. Um, works, words, actions speak louder than your words do. And the actions that this board has taken over the years has clearly shown certificated and classified their worth. Um, I got another call after the last board meeting because I can't stay, and they said, you really need to go online and look at this meeting. Look at what happened after you left. And I did, and my heart broke, and I cried for the teachers that came up here and spoke about that child. And then my sentiment quickly turned to anger when once again, you made it about you clearly about you. I too, at 22 years old, tried to commit suicide. And then Robert said how brave you were to tell everybody about that. That wasn't bravery. Bravery to me was the woman that put her life at risk to save that child. There is a difference on trying to commit suicide and actually doing it. You claim you wrote a letter and because of this result, you wrote a letter to your mom. That's fine and all. I hope you got the help you needed. 
but this broken child actually attempted to kill himself. And you pigging back on his heartbreak was, it wasn't even disgusting, it was beyond that. And the fact that Robert said you were brave for doing it, clearly you showed you are not a mother. But that employee that risked her life, she was a mother. And she did it from her heart and she didn't want recognition. She didn't want anybody calling her out and saying how brave she was, yet she was. Um, Robert, you went and made a comment about how I said you're arrogant. You don't know what I personally think of you. You don't want to know that. But the sites that I get calls from clearly have said that when you go on their campus, you are arrogant. And you stated my name and said, you've never seen me at those schools. Of course you haven't. I have invited this board countless of times to go to my site, which is a special needs school with the county. But nobody goes down there. And that's fine. You can call me out all you want. It doesn't matter to me because, hey, after all, I call you out. And Mr. Mayor, what you did was great. But I also invite you to go into a classroom and see what these teachers do day in and day out, how they put their hearts into their job, and how certificated aides or whoever is in the classroom help these children because after all, we are all here because of these kids. These kids should be our main and only priority. But I understand why you gave, gave Elliot his race. Ms. Olgainley, please wrap up your comments. I will. I still got time. You're, you're, you're actually all right, past but one other minute, 17 So seconds were you over. when you were talking. Okay, so let's not be rude. But I can understand why this board chose to give Elliot his race. Not because he deserved it, but because after all, he's got to find a way to pay for his new house, doesn't he? Thank you, Ms. Logan. Next person I have here is Mrs. Laura Roden. Good evening, board. Welcome. I think you probably know why I'm here. I think I was here last year at this time and probably haven't been in between, but um, it is, as you can see, JUSD holiday food drive time. So this year, instead of the little reminder cans, I went big because I want everyone to go big and I'm hoping, I'm challenging you that all of these will be donated back as part of the collection, which officially started today at the school sites most of which are participating. So we're expecting to have another great year. And uh, the team that I work with, very creative name, the Green Shirt Team. <laughs> They're wonderful. And we've been coming together now for, I think this is my 11th year, um, helping to head this up. And uh, we've got Four, three teachers, I think a teacher on special assignment, some immediate family members of one of the teachers, um, and that's kind of the core group that gets together to put this on. So I think, Ms. Collins, were you able to queue up that little video? Okay, so there's a little video for you, and then I'll just close with a couple words.
you for keying that up. I really appreciate it. Um, it. It truly is, as it says in the video, a 24 hour turnaround miracle. We arrive on that Friday, which this year will be Friday the 13th. We're going to go for good luck. And uh, transportation has miraculously picked up all the donations from all the different sites, delivered them to Hruba Middle School. They're all up on the stage. And at four o'clock, the craziness begins, the sorting and the bagging and the putting everything where it goes so that the following morning these families can come and be blessed with what has been donated by each of these families at our sites, which goes right back out to the sites in our school district, to the families in our school district. And we make it a festive event. We have Santa Claus there. Uh, I believe we're having some games this year. We have music. Um, sometimes we even have some student entertainment. Uh, I hear this year they may be decorating the, the gym a little bit and a holiday theme. So um, it, it's just a, it's an amazing day. And the volunteers that come, the Lions Club provides a baked potato dinner on Friday nights for all of our volunteers, which number between three and 400 students mainly, but also adults that come to help with all of that craziness on Friday. And then another 150 or so show up on Saturday and they become ambassadors. And they go out with each of these families that come through. They bring them all the way through all the different stations and then they take them to their vehicles and help them unload. So it's something that you all can be very proud of. We as a community can be very proud of and it's, it's just very touching to watch it all happen and to realize on Saturday at around four, maybe five o'clock, it's been this whirlwind and it's all finished and everything is, you know, just will start up again the following year. So I just encourage you all to come by either Friday or Saturday, you're welcome to come and help. But if you can just even come and say hi for a few minutes, please re-donate your food up there. And um, we'll all hopefully have a very happy holiday this year. Thank you, Laura, and uh, thank you for um, for continuing these efforts through all these years. And I know uh, uh, you've you've got a great team that you work with. And this is my favorite, so I'm not really sure if I'll be donating those. But thank you again, Laura. Okay. All right. Just kidding. I'll donate them. Um, next one I have here is Lisa Cook. President Garcia. Yes, ma'am. May I ask a question? Yes, you may. Mrs. Routon. Um, what else can you use to contribute? I know last year I went down and I bought candy canes for you. Are there some other things that people, if they don't want to do the foods, they want to help with something else, is there other things they can help with? Uh, stocking stuffers, we do stockings for ages, I think it's three to nine. Okay. Uh, boy or girl, we stuff them with you know, appropriate toys. Okay. Um, so stocking stuffers, uh, new toys. We have a whole toy area that uh, the families get to come and choose Thank you. I know when I was at INA, you uh, got started in this when uh, Mrs. Barella uh, yes. retired from doing that. And um, the families, just the joy on the, the families, the, on their faces, when they submit and look forward to this and going there. I mean, it, that's take, got to take a lot when you have to admit that you don't have the money or the food to feed your family. So this is a great thing for our district. Thank you so much for all you do. Mrs. Cook. Thank you, board members and members of the cabinet for your time this evening. Um, my name is Lisa Cook. I have my um, teacher hat off and my, um, my community member hat on tonight. Um, in fact, I've been attending a school board member since I was a tiny little girl. I remember superintendent, I think it was Ed Hawkins, telling my mom to sit down and be quiet during um, one meeting in the 1970s. So those were the good old days. Um, I remember something about school board um, changing school boundary lines and keeping sixth grade students back in elementary school. 
My mom wasn't happy about the change, but I honestly think that was a change that was for the better for our school district, and I know I personally benefited for it. So change can be good. So tonight I'm asking you to consider a change, a change of our at-large member elections to by district elections. And what that means is at-large elections are defined as a governing body elected or appointed to represent the whole membership of the body. Um, whereas by district, voters who reside within a designated district vote for candidates representing just their specific area. Now, there are uh, quite a few reasons why I think this would be a positive change for our district, having helped several candidates on their elections, both in walking door to door, many, many doors, and just knowing how much they pay for their elections. Um, it would be a positive change just because the, of the financial cost for running an election. Um, if it, it were less, it would open up the possibility of running for school board to so many more of our community members. Also, um, they would be able to meet the community members a little easier. I mean, our community is growing and will continue to grow, so focusing our attention on one area and what those members need, I think, would be um, a positive thing. Not that you guys don't do a good job. I mean, just listening to all you know walks of life and you know aspects of the community, I think you do do a marvelous job, but there's always room for improvement. Um, mostly, I just think that district voting would be the best thing for our students. I know the Voting Rights Act has supported a change to district elections, and our own Arupa Valley City Council has decided to make that move. So um, I hope you will agree with me that this, um, the change can be a good thing. It ended up being so for my family in the 1970s, and I think that it's time for a change um, within our district for district elections now. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mrs. Cook. Next one here is Heather Schaefer. Good evening. Um, I've been a teacher in JUSD for about 13 years now. During this time, I've been a member of both the math and the NGSS units of study. I've been a, a gate technology, PBIS, and testing coordinator. I was a district coach, and I'm currently an induction coach. I was one of the teachers that had the privilege to pilot the Chromebooks in our classrooms. I love our district and often volunteer to try the new programs. Our district has always been a leader in education. When rolling out new programs, you spend the money to bring in outside experts and gather teacher input. One reason I think our district has been so successful is because you involve and listen to the teachers and make the adjustments as needed along the way. When you rolled out NGSS, you brought in Dr. Samani and we're constantly revamping and making improvements with the implementation of NGSS. When you rolled out the math units, you brought in Lori Cook the, um, to guarantee our district would be successful implementing Common Core in the classroom. For me, inclusion has not been implemented this, this way. We have no outside specialists advising us along the way. This is my second year teaching the inclusion group, and I actually request them. I love my um, IEP students. I love my students, and I've seen growth in many of them, but I've also seen many of them suffer. I believe inclusion can work, but it needs to be done correctly. The district is going to need to invest the money, and we need district support. In my classroom, Monday through Thursday, I team teach with our educational specialist. After teaching our lesson, we split our classroom into two smaller groups. If you walked into our class, you wouldn't be able to identify our IEP students, but Fridays are different stories. On Friday, I am alone. I have 28 students, eight are on IEPs, one's on a 504, and the other one's in the process of getting on at 504. I have four in the process of getting tested. That is half of my class in need of some type of accommodation. I haven't even discussed my other students are, who are below grade level. Every Friday, I'm alone for 50 minutes. I spend that time putting out fires, 
I often feel like we are on a lifeboat and I'm plugging holes and belling water so we don't sink. I am embarrassed to say there's not a lot of teaching that happens in my class on Friday. And that breaks my heart and it's hard for me to admit. I invite you into my classroom, but I would ask that you come Monday through Thursday and then come back on Friday and see the difference that having one extra person in my classroom makes. If you're going to push and, oh, sorry, 50 minutes doesn't seem like a lot, but that's 200 lost minutes a month. We teach approximately 36 weeks out of the year. That's 1,800 lost math minutes in a year in a class that can't afford to lose any minutes. I try to, try to make up those minutes with after school tutoring, lunch tutoring, but not all my students can attend. If you're going to push inclusion into all schools, you're going to have to invest in support. I'm begging you to give me the support I need to teach my students. I need another body in my classroom with me at all times, or it's lost teaching minutes. If I can't have another teacher on Friday, then I need an aide, an aide that is trained and able to teach math. I can't spend my instruction time teaching my aide how to support my students. My same class attends five other classes throughout the day, but is unsupported for half the day. It isn't fair to them or the teachers trying to teach them. We need your support. I've not been involved in the union until now. I am not a union supporter. But the district has pushed me to participate just like they are pushing many other teachers who haven't been union supporters. In the past, we haven't had high teacher participation rate, but with inclusion, I predict, te I predict teacher partic participation will inc increase. When you sit down this year to negotiate our contract, please know that inclusion is something that needs to be discussed. I know I will not vote for a contract that doesn't address and fix these issues. It's unsafe to my students, and it's unsafe to me, and it's unfair to them. We need more support in the classroom. And we need, I worked in Paris where um, I had an inclusion teacher with me and she followed those kids throughout the day in middle school. So they were never without support. And I know it's going to cost money, but if we're going to do it, we have always been the leaders. Harupa has always been the leaders. Let's do it right so the other districts look at us, sit down with the teachers and ask us what we need so we can do it right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schaefer. Just uh, so you know, we've talked about this a little bit with Mr. Dabrowski, and I think uh, um, there is some um, some review going on. So just know that that we do we do hear you, and um, so and it's not always the, it's not always a, a quick change. You know, government really really operates kind of slow. So thank you for your comments. All right, next one I have here is. Amanda Alston. Did you get that right, Amanda? Good evening, all. Um, forgive me as I eat my frog leg to get my courage to do this. Um, so my son recently started at Camino Real um, Elementary School as a kindergartner. And on the very first day, I noticed that they do not have a shade structure covering the kindergarten TK play area. Um, there is a very large shade structure for the primary and as well as the um, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. And so I um, started investigating on why this was going on. And I found out that for approximately 14 years, they've been asking for a shade structure and have un been, able to, been unable to receive one. Um, they've even had people volunteer to donate it, build it, install it, and it's been denied because they're not contractors with the school district. Um, so one of my suggestions was us to raise the funds ourselves as kindergarten and TK moms. We have come together and we've said, yeah, we'll raise the funds ourselves. In order to do this, though, we need the support of the board to open up a parent organization. In the past, it was told that the kindergartners could not have um, their own fundraising because it was discriminatory against all the other grades. Well, currently at Camino Real, they have the Merit and Gate 
kids have their own fundraising opportunities and so do the fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, such as Boo Grams, candy canes that they sell at Christmas time. The kindergartners are unable to do any kind of funding for themselves in order to participate in extracurricular funding for anything that they need. So I'm just asking the board to consider allowing and the kindergartners, TK and, and primary too, because they also do not have their own fundraising, to allow us to open up a parent organization in order to primary donate funds or raise funds for those children in order to um, raise money for the shade structure and for other extracurricular activities that they can't afford because they can't do their own funding. Yes, we do PTA raising, but there's no money in the PTA funding to donate to the kindergartners for the shade structure. I do understand that it's expensive and I do understand that it's not always in a budget, but we are really willing to raise as much money as possible to donate towards it. and. Um, it's for the safety of our kids. You know, I was don't eat, I was there standing there on a 100 degree day and they were caged up in a room at recess because they couldn't go outside because it was too hot. When it's warm outside, yeah, we're California, we get five rainy days a year. <laughs> but they can't sit on those play structures, they can't play on them, and they're in the classroom and they can't do anything. And it's frustrating for the teacher because all that unspent energy is just it's ridiculous to see these kids bouncing off the walls. So I just ask that you guys help me figure out or allow me to do fundraising for the kindergartners to earn this play structure. Ms. Ms. Salton, if you could get Mr. Dabrowski your information, maybe he can help you work on that. Maybe that, or at least kind of figure out the uh, parent organization part of it and see if there's something you can do. Thank you so much, Mr. I Dabrowski appreciate would it. Take your info. Thank you. Mr. John Chavez. First of all, I'd like to say that uh, I, I served on the school board when Mrs. Cook was, uh, she was really hard, she was tough, but she was not ignored. A lot of things that she brought uh, was discussed, and uh, even though they, she was, she was one of the ones that came up to the board and, and did whatever. But we did listen to her. Anyway, I hope you, that the board does the same. But I am here to speak on Assembly Bill 182. It's the California Voting Rights Act. Uh, Arupa School Board elections should be by trustee areas. They are, we do have trustees, but they are voting at large. And trustee areas, the Senate Bill 182 was passed in 2001. And, uh, and you should be uh, voting by trustee areas. Uh, I ask that you, the board, um, direct the administration to uh, to agendize the uh, the the elections to change the trustee area to the trustee area to fully comply comply with the assembly bill 182. I congratulate the city Harupa City Council. They came up with this uh, and they went ahead and did it, and that's how they do it now, even though it was at large. Um, There were cities that, uh, that chose to uh, to fight the uh, since, since it's a Senate bill to fight the Senate bill. It was very costly. Palm, Palmdale spent 4.7 million, Modesto 3 million, Anaheim 1.1 million. This is the kind of funds that UE and, and the Harupa district don't need to spend. Uh, We don't, you know, if we, you decide to fight it, then uh, it's, it's, it's gonna come and, uh, and you can do it now or you're gonna see an, an attorneys come in 
and you're going to have misuse of very, very uh, funds that should be used for education rather than rather than fighting a losing battle. So I I asked the the board to consider talking to administration and saying, hey, we need to do this and put it in the agenda. And I know you guys cannot do it uh, unless it's agendized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chavez. Okay. Ms. Wendy Eccles. I just prepared some information for you. They're all exactly the same, just different color folders. And so I have a little bit prepared here today. So, right. so I'm just going to say good evening to everyone in the room tonight um, and continue to thank Mr. Brooks and Mr. Dubrovsky for our problem solving sessions. I, I know we still have a ways to go, but I appreciate your time always. Um, as a first year chapter president, I feel that it is very important to get out to meet the members that I represent. As such, I have spent the last few weeks, uh, sometimes with the members of our bargaining team, to get out to the sites and really listen to the members' concerns and realities. What I'm hearing is pretty universal and reiterates what we've been sharing with you. Ever increasing workload, issues with student behavior, inclusive practices, employee morale. With those concerns, I felt the need to dig a little deeper. Workload, more and more is being added to our members' overflowing platters and nothing is being taken off. Advisory with a multitude of expectations, impact teams, changing late work policies, secondary level. Guided reading, avid expectations, impact teams at elementary level. Some of the grade levels are having to do all of these brand new things at one time. And this is just a sprinkling of what I'm hearing. Student behavior is getting worse, even down to the primary levels. Our youngest students are starting to exhibit more and more violent behaviors. These behaviors are traumatizing to both the teaching and learning environment. Those students who don't exhibit those behaviors are experiencing those behaviors in their own forms of trauma when they're having to evacuate classrooms. The students go home to their parents and they're not the same. They're afraid to come to school or they start acting out at home. This impacts the learning environment. Our teachers are experiencing stress on levels I've never seen in my career, ranging from our newest teachers to our most veteran. I spend a lot of time on the phone with my members and many times I drive home crying with them because of the pain and the stress that they're feeling. So how do we address these issues? Are they insurmountable? Where do we start? What supports can we begin to institute? Again, many of our students and educators have so much trauma, some so deep that it's affecting multiple aspects of both their school and home lives. Now, I believe that we can do a couple things to at least get this conversation continued to be started. I've provided each of you, including Mr. Brooks and Mr. Duchon, a folder that includes several articles. Uh, articles about stress in the workplace and how to address school employee well-being through labor management collaboration. Additionally, I have provided information about schools and communities first a potential ballot initiative that would address corporate property tax laws first instituted with the passage of Prop 13 in 1978. Getting this initiative on the November 2020 ballot and passing it could lead to almost $12 billion in funding for our schools and our communities. Think about all the services that that would pay for. Like Mrs. Schaefer said, more support in the classroom. This funding could be used to provide trauma-informed practices, more mental health counselors, teachers, psychologists, paraprofessionals, and so on. I have in my hand right here 
a 10 page long list of supporters of Schools and Communities First, including education, faith-based, philanthropic, housing, health, labor, social justice, political, small business, environmental groups, and individuals, as well as elected leaders from the federal, state, and local levels. I ask that the board sign this petition that I have right here um, and consider adopting a resolution, which I always have, I also have a copy of for you in that folder, um, in support of schools and communities first, so we can start to address these issues with proper funding. Without that funding, because that's what we hear a lot of, is the funding issues. And I know it's true. Without that additional funding, we can't provide the services that are need. And we want to be able to support our students to the best of our abilities. So thank you for that. And if you want to sign the petition, again, I have a Thank you, Wendy. I'm more than happy for all of you Riverside County re residents to sign it. Thank you, Wendy. I think, um, <laughs> and I agree with you. I completely agree. And I, um, I'm actually on the endorsement list for that. Oh, thank you. Oh, website. you weren't on the list when I printed it out today. It's been on there for about oh, a year. Oh, you know why? It's probably We actually, um, the school board actually passed a resolution, I believe it was last year. We'll double check on that. For schools and that. communities first. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was, um, it may have been generalized. It was something okay. the California School Board was working on well, to get all the districts to do it. The School Association is working on an initiative that won't be ready for 2020. Yeah, we've got, uh, I know there's several efforts going on. Um, there's several efforts going on. It would on. just be really wonderful to know that we're all in this together. We will take a look. Our association has endorsed it, so. Absolutely. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Next one I have here, the last one I have here is Mr. Michael Peterson. Good evening, everybody. I first want to commend all the speakers that have the courage to kind of come up here and speak in front of all of you. It takes a lot of courage and uh, support to come up and do that. Secondly, the food thing is really making me hungry, so I think you guys got to move that food for some of us that haven't eaten yet. Um, real quick, my name is Michael Peterson, as you heard. Um, I'm a father of three children, one that is graduated from Patriot High School that now plays collegiate soccer at Cal State San Marcos. My son is a junior at Patriot High School that plays soccer there, and my three-year-old is a, I mean three-year-old, my eight-year-old is a third grader at uh, Stone. I'm here to kind of talk about trying to get some support for athletics at Patriot High School. Um, the, with the bond coming up, I'm hoping that we can garner some support to have some of our facilities there at Patriot improved. Um, as my daughter played two years ago there, and my son plays there now, just noticing that the field is atrocious if that's the word you want to use. Um, I appreciate uh, board member Garcia coming out to uh, a playoff game a couple years ago at uh, Rubido, which is very difficult when the girls at uh, Ruba, I mean at uh, Patriot are really working hard and they have to go to another site to have their playoff games played. Um, more importantly than athletics is just uh, going to a graduation for your own daughter at a different site that I think um, is something that needs to be addressed. Um, again, I'm a teacher in San Bernardino City Unified School District. I have been for 25 years. I'm the lead negotiator there in San Bernardino City, so I totally understand money and budgets and um, the, the like, but I think uh, we're really asking for your support. Um, if the bond does pass, um, I would hope that um, we would be on that list to get some type of facility help. As you can hear from the students, um, a majority of their report was uh, sport-based. Um, sports are important to our students. Um, we have students that are going on to college with athletic scholarships to Division One, Division Two, in-state, out-of-state. Um, so for a school that was built, I would think, 14 years ago, not to have a restroom on the facilities for you know the last two years, I think that's inappropriate and that's something um, that we appreciate that was addressed, but it was way far um, out where you have sports facilities with no restroom. So I'm asking for your support. I'm asking hopefully that we can get a list um, and I'm willing to do my part. Um, I'd like to see some kind of form or list of what are the needs for facilities. 
Um, so as a, a community member, um, I can do my part to help support that, and I'm willing to do that. As I said in the past with both uh, board members, I'm willing to be a helpful person in this process. I'm not here just to complain. I'm here to put my feet out and, and help you guys in that respect. So. Um, again, I just hope that we can get some support in helping uh, the facilities at Patriot High School to get, you know, improved. So thank you very much for your cooperation. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. I just want to, I just want to say that I appreciate you coming out and, and speaking on this matter. And the restroom issue at Patriot, um, it was because of someone like yourself that right. came up and right. spoke at a board meeting. Right. Uh, that there had never been any bathrooms planned out there. So right. uh, thank you for, for also coming out as well. Mr. Dushan, you have a comment? Yeah, I was just going to say. If the board um, does make the decision to put it on the ballot, right. I would be happy to meet with you and talk about our, or Dr. Hansen, talk sure. about our facility plans. For sure. And we've done that in the past. I don't know right. if you remember. Right. Oh, yeah, we've, remember. we've done that in the past. Yeah. But I would yeah. be willing to do that as well. we recognize the need at the school. Yes, I appreciate so. it because so. it, it's pretty tough. Yeah. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Got no more cards here. So we're going to move on to number five. Administrative reports and written communications. Give me a second here, I lost it. Okay, 5A, system-wide AVID report. Mr. Dabrowski. All right, thank you. Um, well, as the board is aware, this year we were fortunate to win two Golden Bell Awards, one for dual immersion system-wide and the other for our system-wide AVID program. Uh, so tonight I want to talk just a little bit about our AVID program, about AVID as a system, and about AVID in Harupa Unified. So you'll have that information as you attend that awards ceremony. Um, all right. I'm waiting for that to start. So uh, I'll just start by telling you AVID's mission. AVID stands for Advancement via Individual Determination. And its mission is to close the achievement gap by preparing all students for college readiness and success in a global society. Um, AVID was a program that began, or a system that began in the 80s. It began at one high school in San Diego with 32 students. Those students were all low-income students of color. And it was designed to take students who may not have college-going members of their family or some of those advantages and prepare them to access college and be successful in college. Um, and it was very successful. It started at Claremont High School. By 1986, the Department of Education provided funding so that AVID was able to expand to all of the San Diego high schools. And then in the 90s, as it continued to expand, it came to Riverside County. Um, both Rubido and Rupa Valley, the then two only high schools in J Rupa Valley, um, started at AVID. By the end of the decade, our middle schools began. And then as Patriot opened up, uh, Patriot began with an AVID program as well. And so today, AVID is in over 7,000 schools, serving over 2 million students. It's in 47 states. It's in all of the Department of Defense schools and in 16 countries. Um, and we are a part of what's called RIMS AVID, which is the four counties, Riverside, Inyo, Mono, and San Bernardino County. Um, when local control funding came along, county offices stopped receiving funding for AVID programs, and yet our four county group felt like it was way too important to discontinue, to, to discontinue having that support. So RIMS AVID continued, and we still get support from those four counties. Um, and RIMS AVID as a group, those four counties, has the highest concentration of AVID students in the world, across the nation. It's, it's a very highly supported, highly concentrated AVID group. And as you'll see uh, later on in the presentation, Harupa stands out even among RIMS AVID. So in secondary schools, middle and high school, um, which is where AVID has been the longest, the way it looks is a daily elective class. So students choose to be in the AVID system. They take an elective class. Um, 
It's designed for students who are roughly in the AVID middle and who may be first time college at potential attendees in their family. And you can see in that graphic a little um, sort of example of their, their week. So Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, they may receive college readiness, study skills curriculum, things that they call the hidden curriculum that allows students to be successful in their secondary classroom and develop the skills needed to both get into college and be successful in college. And then Tuesday and Thursday would be AVID tutorials. And those are groups of students led by a college tutor who look at the problems they're struggling with because AVID students are challenged to take challenging classes. For example, a high number of AVID students take advanced placement classes. So AVID, the students bring a, a challenging problem that they're struggling with and as a group those students work on those problems and learn the skills and strategies necessary to be successful in those challenging courses. They elect to provide students with academic support. Wicker strategies, that's a sort of a term you'll hear a lot in the AVID world, and it stands for writing to learn, inquiry, collaboration, organization, and reading to learn. So those are sort of the pillars of the sort of academic portion of the AVID program. It's all of those, lots of lessons and strategies that come with those, um, those elements of that um, acronym. They also receive social and emotional support and then academic and college transition guidance. And that includes like one-on-one -on -one steps and how to apply for your FAFSA, how to do college applications, how to make sure that you're taking the right courses, visits to colleges so that students can see and envision what it might be like to be in attendance of a college and therefore make them really want to, to gain that. Um, all of those things are found within that secondary AVID elective. And the data shows that it's extremely successful. For example, that the class of 2019 JUSD, 95% um, of our AVID students completed A through G requirements, so we're eligible to attend a CSU or a UC system college. 82% took at least one AP course. 91% of them submitted their FAFSA, so their application to gain um, federal student assistance for college. And there's a lot of research that shows when you turn in your FAFSA and you realize that there is college money for you, you are much more likely to attend and complete college. 86% were accepted to a four-year institution, and as of this fall, 95% of the AVID students were enrolled in college um, starting in the fall. So the numbers and the success of our students who choose to be AVID students in the secondary um, is, it speaks for itself. It's just a picture of some of our students at College Signing Day showing the, the colleges of their choice from last year. And so the question that our secondary schools began to ask, and even the AVID system began to ask, is how can more secondary students experience the AVID effect? How can more than just those students that choose to take AVID as their elective um, experience some of those great things that help students so much? And so um, one element that we have embarked upon is prefer preparing um, PD for our non-AVID teachers, those students that are teachers that are not teaching the AVID elective, um, in those WICOR strategies. For example, last week we had a focused note-taking tr uh, training for teachers, teachers that were not AVID teachers, so that all students could benefit from that, um, that great strategy of being able to take notes, to, to annotate your notes, to go back and study your notes, and to use notes successfully, which is a fundamental skill that you need in college. Um, School-wide use of WICOR strategies to help all students access and master learning, and then improving academic guidance and access to counselors so that all of our students can have that one-on-one -on -one guidance and, and motivation and support to be able to understand how to, how to apply, how to get the money, how to be accepted, how to take the courses that you need to take to be able to get into college and be prepared to be successful in college. So those are all elements of what's happening to expand the AVID strategies in our secondary schools beyond those students that are taking AVID. And then several years ago, AVID thought, why not reach more students? So, you know, we have this whole elementary world and we know that students begin to formulate their opinions about what they're going to do with their lives when they're in elementary school. And if students don't have that role model of college going, um, they don't have that mindset that college is for me. And so we want to instill that in them as young as transitional kindergarten. 
So um, AVID expanded and began a program of AVID Elementary. Um, and they also started AVID for higher education. So there are uh, higher education AVID programs in post-secondary. Um, but I won't talk about that because that doesn't pertain to us here. Because of the, the development needs of AVID students at the elementary level, it's different than what you find at the secondary level. And the difference is, number one, that it's for all students. So AVID elementary, when a school becomes AVID elementary school, it's for all students, K, TK6. They all benefit from those things. It's not those that just choose to take an elective course at the secondary level. Students learn and strengthen their academic behaviors. They engage in higher level thinking. They promote a college going culture. For, for those of you that have gone around to our elementary schools, you'll see that every one of our schools has adopted a college, has a college going culture. We have our college kickoff days at the elementary school and a much greater focus on college from the earliest levels so that students can envision that yes, this is for me, even when they're five. Um, and also pro well, promoting college and career exploration early in students' education. This is the way in which AVID Elementary rolled out in Harupa. So in 2015, 16, seven schools came on board. In 16, 17, an additional six schools. These are elementary schools. In 17, 18, th the then remaining three schools. And then in 1920, uh, Del Sol, our newest school, became an AVID school. So all of our elementary schools are AVID elementary schools uh, school-wide. And I can, like I mentioned that in RIMS AVID, in that four county consortium, um, that's the highest concentration of AVID students worldwide. And in RIMS, there are only five districts that have AVID at every elementary site, and we are one of them. So we even are at sort of the top of the pile in RIMS AVID. Um, and and I, I like to tell this story, and she's not here, but you know when we began AVID Elementary, we had a, a RIMS AVID coach, and she was, um, assigned to help us and was extremely valuable to our teachers and our principals in um, implementing AVID and supported us for four years. And at some point, she decided she was ready to take the next step in her career, which was to become a principal. And um, she was only interested in applying in one school district, and that would be Harupa. So now Daisy Flores, our principal at Van Buren Elementary, is, um, is here and has joined us as a principal. But one of the reasons she is here is because of the successful way that AVID was implemented and the support that we have in our district for our students. So our data story, um, we are increasing the rigor and the engagement for all of our students system-wide. College and career exploration at our elementary school uses the AVID curriculum to explore um, careers, colleges, what that means so that our students can learn in an age-appropriate way um, and become interested and feel like they have access to uh, college. A, our A through G completion rate is rising. Our college going rate is rising. Of course, if you look back in the corner, you can see that California map and that United States map with all those pins. And those pins are students that are attending um, colleges across the nation and across the state. And, and some of that is due to um, what AVID has provided and what we have provided. Um, and additionally, our CCAP, college access, community college access pathways, dual enrollment courses with um, RCC and Norco College, uses AVID with 10th grade students, and our students, 10th graders, are taking community college courses and have a 98% pass rate, which is um, fabulous, and we're very excited about it. So that's just a little bit about AVID in Harupa Unified, where it, where it started, where we have, what we have done and what we plan to do, um, just to give you a little information as you head off to CSBA next month. Thank you, Mr. Dabrowski. Any questions or comments? Mr. Bradford. Okay. <clears throat> does RIMS include San Bernardino County? Yes, it does. Okay. Yeah, it's it's um, Riverside, Inyo, Mono, and San Bernardino. That's, that's what I've, okay. Um, I'm interested in, in it saying college and career exploration seen as neither of my sons uh, exhibited interest in going to college. So it sounds like I like the higher level thinking, the career exploration. So how is, how is, can you give me some examples of how 
not just college readiness, but how you're, you're getting kids to think. If you're not college, thinking, thinking about college, you're still worthy. Sure. I can give you just two brief examples. One is that one element of the college and career exploration cur curriculum is career interest surveys. And so students begin to take surveys to see what they're interested in. And that um, lists both college and career options. So that it's not limited just to colleges um, or lists careers that require or don't require uh, extensive college. Additionally, you know, one of the things that we have learned in looking at um, college and career readiness, in particular the work of David Conley, who is a researcher in the area of college and career readiness, one of the things we've learned is that the, the requirements for both college and career, those programs that might be certificate based or not their traditional four-year college level careers, require the same skill set. They require the academic behaviors of organization, collaboration. It's like the elements of Wicker, writing, inquiry, collaboration, organization, and reading. And so those skill sets, while they are very well suited to having students be successful in college, they're also very well suited to having students be successful in a career. So they serve sort of both masters at the same time. Thank you. When it gets to the point where they branch and you can see that a student is, is going to be college oriented or, or career or technical oriented, how, how do you divert the, the student who's going to be going like maybe through CTE? So when students are making the transition from eighth to ninth grade, the, when, the, when the counselors come from the high school to the middle school and they begin that registration process, they have pathway oriented courses. So, so, so students look at the different pathways that are available and those pathways include all of the CTE pathways that the colleges have. And, and for example, we'll be having our, our CTE um, showcase very soon. And so um, that's when students begin to make those decisions and we look at you know, CTE and we try to provide CTE sectors that are, as you know, market driven, that, are, that will um, have the capacity to make students eligible for a good career and often that lead to a certificate post-secondary, which may not be the typical college but might be a, you know, a, a leading into a, a, I'm drawing a blank, but a, like a career oriented trades type certificate. And as long as we're talking about CTE, it's over there, but it sounds like some of it's at the, the community center. Yeah, it's over, it's over there, and it's over here, and it's kind of all around between the, the center and here, yes. Are you going to have good signage? Yes. OK, thank you. Any, any other questions from the board comments? Yeah, I had a question. Uh, Mr. But first, congratulations on uh, the Golden Bell. That's always really um, nice and cool. To, Thank you. And, I, and I'll relay that to Mrs. Pace, who was awesome. elemental um, in doing it. My question was also uh, about college and career. But I'm looking at the 91% submitted for FAFSA. Is that because not all of the students are going to college? Like, I'm wondering why it's not 100%. Why it's not 100%. Why not all yeah, the students are or do they not qualify or? That's a good question and I, I don't have a specific answer. I could think that there could be parents that recognize that their income is outside the boundary of what would make them eligible and so they don't complete it. Um, I, I'm just guessing at this point. I, I don't have an, an answer for what that 9% might be. Okay. Thank you. I just want to mention, I think it could be. I know we, we almost didn't do that and uh, we're glad we did, you know, for our students. Um, Mr. Duchon, you have a comment? Yeah, a couple of comments. I do think in addition to not meeting the income, being above the income requirements, some people are reluctant to put their financial data onto any document. Um, there are some districts that have required it, and we, we made a deliberate choice not to for that reason because it would force parents and, pun and punish kids for not turning it in. We do encourage it, and I think Harupa Valley was recognized as one of the top FAFSA performers two years ago. Two years, two in, years in a row. Two years in a row. Two years in a row in the top 30 in the state. And out of those 30, half of them were, were um, like charter or private schools. So it's pretty darn good. The, the other thing, and, and we want our students to be prepared for either career or college. 
So our hope really is that they're not making that choice when they graduate, but able to open that door either way. Some, some students go to a career that's not college oriented after they've been to college and vice versa. Some students go to college after they've been in a career for a few years. So the other thing that accompanies that, and Mrs. Pace has done just an incredible job with this, is more and more of our career tech classes count toward the A through G requirements for UC and Cal State. So. Mrs. Chard. I just wanted to congratulate um, our avid administrators and the, the teachers, everyone who's put this into works in our school district. Because I've been here a long time and I've seen it in the elementary level. They didn't have it. When my kids were in high school 30 years ago, um, that's when it came. And like you said, in the 80s and ni or 90s when it came to our district. And I have a granddaughter that's in kindergarten. And to hear her talk about going to college now, my kids never would have thought of college in even though I had gone to college and my husband too, they wouldn't have talked about that. But these kids are now looking at what they want to be. And when um, uh, Sylvia and I went to per uh, Peralta, or, um, Indian Hills Elementary, we received letters back from the kids. And those kids are already thinking in their mind what they want to be. When we talked about, uh, on career day, we talked about our jobs and how we got there. And we got from two different pathways. Um, and so, for those kids, they were putting themselves in our position and saying, you know, you are an example of what I want to be. Whether it be the position, being on a board or being a secretary, they still want to get that education. They don't want to stop. And I think that has been a great thing for our district. And, and this is a, truly exemplifies all the hard work that's gone through it. So thank you very much. Congratulations again. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? Thank you, Mr. Dabrowski, for a great presentation. All right, move on to 5B, facilities update. Dr. Hansen. Good evening. Uh, so I'd like to share a little bit with you some of the activities that we've uh, accomplished since the special board meeting when we introduced uh, the bond measure, the potential bond measure uh, this evening. Uh, we, we've done a variety of activities to, uh, for community outreach to provide information uh, over the potential bond. We've done that through peach jar flyers that have gone home or gone to uh, anybody that has uh, emails with the district. We've done a, a mailer that was mailed home. It also included a survey for people to respond or send back information or input. Uh, we've received about 70 of those responses back from the, the community mailers that were put out. We've also started a thought exchange where uh, Anybody that engages in this process, Thought Exchange is, is, is essentially an app where people can engage with us uh, over specific topics. And in this case, it's the topic of what they value in school facilities. And so we've had our students at our schools, uh, we hand out cards at the community meetings. We've done it through Peach Jar. We put a link in the horizon. We also send it out through Q Communication to provide as many opportunities for um, people to engage in this process and uh, so that's that's working out well we got a lot of responses from from our students uh, sometimes they're more concerned about how long passing periods are not so much about the facilities but um, uh, we I think the majority of our responses came uh, from students which was nice it's always good to have student voice in the process the horizon uh, like I mentioned before, we were able to put the information in the fact sheet in the horizon, as well as the link in the QR code to engage through Thought Exchange, QQ Communication, social media posts, and uh, today a, a peach jar flyer went out again to direct them to the website and the information, basically all the information we've been sharing, but how they can find it on the website. So those are some of the things that we've done um, in terms of community outreach. We've also embarked on, on a variety, a series of community meetings to engage uh, various groups within the community as well as elected officials. Uh, thus far, we've had obviously the special study uh, board session. We've met with the Rotary. We've met with both associations, uh, Karen Spiegel, uh, personally with her in her office. Uh, we've had the community town hall meeting. Uh, we've also met with Assemblywoman Cervantes' office with her staffer, as well as uh, Congressman Ticano's office and his staffer. And we uh, were able to present to the group area 
Recreation and Parks District. We have scheduled future. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not clicking ahead. We have future me meetings scheduled. We, uh, we have the, uh, the inner agency meeting this Friday. We'll be able to share the information with uh, city leaders, community leaders that attend that interagency meeting, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, RCSD, the City Council, uh, JCSD, the Lions Club, and Senator uh, Roth's office as well. So we are doing our due diligence in, in reaching out to key organizations and the leadership within the community to provide information and inform them on what this measure what this measure entails and, and how it will affect uh, our community. So what we share at a lot of these meetings, um, the main focus is the needs that exist. Obviously we share what we've been able to accomplish with Measure EE, but we also show the needs that still exist within our district at many of our schools. I want to make, make sure that I make the point here that uh, to not take the information like the, uh, the needs that exist for a lack of effort uh, from our from in from the district right we have a wonderful maintenance and operations staff who work uh, tirelessly and are dedicated to the students of Harupa and do their job uh, very well and work hard to maintain our schools on a day-to-day -day basis and our schools are in excellent excellent shape however the resources that are available to us uh, do not allow us to advance the modernization of our schools because the costs are so high so don't um, don't confuse the, the numbers for a lack of attention because um, we give a, a large uh, amount of attention to our facilities and our staff are very dedicated to our students. But what I'd like to point out on this, um, the needs document is the costs associated with modernizing schools. These are rough estimates. We, we take a $350 per square foot um, cost to renovate or modernize schools. We also have the state grants that are available for those schools, uh, just over almost uh, $38 million available to us if we were to able to um, modernize those schools and, and access state dollars to help offset the costs. I'd also like to point out in the green column there, those are the schools that are beyond the timeline for modernization. A school could be modernized, they qualify for state grants 25 years when they've become 25 years old or 25 years from the last time that they were modernized as you can see there from the remaining schools this isn't all of the schools we have in our district we have twice as many schools in our district but what is remaining uh, 12 of those schools are beyond the, their modernization timeline in the orange dna indicates schools that have never been modernized so we think of the Camino Reals and, and the Sunny Slopes as some of our newer schools, but yet they're in the 30 year, they've, they're approaching 30 plus years and they haven't had an opportunity to be modernized. And so there's a great need there to go in and, and give attention to those schools. Uh, we heard this evening um, about a stadium and athletic facilities. There's greater needs than just the modernization that we see here. These, these, are, this, these costs are strictly modernization. Um, it doesn't include stadiums and and theater renovations and Hrupa Valley which is 29 28 years old that um, needs modernization and uh, there's there's other needs right so this is a snapshot of of the cost and the magnitude of needs that exist that we're just not able to accomplish with measure EE as we come to a close with that program the last point I'd like to make on the, make on this slide is that we see the state grants that are available we cannot access state grants without local dollars. Those state, the state grants are not additional taxes, right? When the state passes a school construction bond, uh, that simply directs the governor to set aside money in, his, in the general fund to pay the debt service on school construction bonds. It's not additional taxes to the community. Uh, state, uh, when those dollars are available, if a school state bond passes, which the state is putting a bond on in the March 2020 uh, election, uh, 9 billion to K-12. We cannot access those dollars without local dollars. What that means is that our taxes, which we pay and, and, and the governor utilizes for his general budget, if he sets those aside for school construction projects throughout the state and we don't have local dollars, our taxes, our tax dollars are going to other school districts. So we have to have local dollars in order to access those, those grants. And of course, that offsets our program and allows us to extend the program even, even further. 
And then lastly, this is a snapshot of the program that you will be uh, voting on this evening. We're looking at um, $42 per 100,000 of assessed valuation. The assessed or the median assessed valuation in Harupi, uh, city of Harupa is 234,000, which leaves just under $100 for the average median homeowner. But keep in mind, it's not, or I shouldn't say average, it's a median homeowner, right? So it's not average, it's the median um, assessed valued home, which means half might have a home that's more expensive and half will have uh, homes that are less expensive. But to the median home, uh, assessed valued home, it's just under $100. The terms are about 25 years. And then the last thing I'd like to point out on this slide is the technology tranche. We will continue the same program that we, we utilized in Measure E. Our Chromebooks, this one-to-one -one devices that that uh, were given to our students came from bond dollars. Those devices are financed in short term, in a short using a short term uh, mechanism we call tranches, which means that those devices are paid for uh, within the life the lifetime of the device. Um, many times it's before that. So our life our lifespan uh, on our devices are about four years. This program, when we tranche those seven million dollars uh, to set aside for Chromebooks. We would, pay, we would pay those Chromebooks off within the life, the life uh, span of the device, within four years. Many times it's even sooner, like it, within two years. Uh, so that's a really important point because we heard that message loud and clear from the community with Measure EE that, that the community was not willing to finance devices such as computers, short-term lifespans for long-term, uh, with long-term debt. And so that resonated with us and we put that program together and we would continue that same program moving forward. There is a need, obviously, to continue uh, to provide Chromebooks or devices for our students. That's been a tremendous um, value for our students to, pr to gain a, uh, an optimal uh, learning environment and educational experience, and we would want to continue that, and we would do that through uh, a short-term financing program. Um, so that's, these are essentially the, uh, it's kind of a snapshot the, the important points uh, of the program. Right now we're looking at about four series of bonds. We would, we would issue every two years, and uh, each issuance is 20, a 25 year term, which would take us out to about 2050 when the last one would fall off. So every 25 years, one of those issuances would fall off two years later, the next one, two years later, the next one. Um, so that's essentially the information, and, and you'll have the opportunity, and I'm sure um, Ms. Ford will share, uh, may share more information when we get to, the, to uh, that action item. But I wanted to provide information tonight. We provided a lot of information in the study, uh, special study session. We showed what we've done with Measure EE. We identified the needs that still exist and, and, and what the program would look like. Tonight I wanted to share with you the educational portion of what we've done with the community and the outreach that we've done and how we've uh, strived to inform our community. Uh, on the measures and then provide kind of a snapshot of what the program would look like. Um, and I, I think it's important to keep in mind that, you know, the opportunity tonight is is to provide by by um, passing this resolution is to allow the community to decide. Right? That's what we're doing this evening or, or you would be doing this evening. But it's, it's simply giving the, the community an opportunity um, to decide what their priorities are. Um, and I really, uh, what resonated a lot tonight was the the uh, inspirational comment, right? The uh, eat the frog. Sometimes we have to uh, do the hard thing for the greater good. And I really appreciate uh, your comments tonight, uh, Mrs. Regal. I think uh, it's very relevant. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. Mr. Dushan? Yeah, I want to follow with a couple comments. First of all, thank you, Dr. Hansen, um, your team for an extraordinary amount of work, Mrs. Ford. Um, we have been working as a district for literally months with the community, with consultants, with experts in both polling, in looking at the types of issuances that would be available, looking at the state program. So I, I think I would be, no, I know I would be remiss as superintendent if I didn't tell you that I believed it was incredibly important for the children in our district to afford every child the opportunity to have a classroom that's as good as the classrooms at Del Sol. Now, you cannot do that. 
you have a rare opportunity and in California the closest you can get is allow the voters to decide. If you were in many states in the country, it would be totally your decision. You could, you could levy a tax, add a millage is what they call it. Um, but you can't do that. But you can give the voters in our community the one opportunity they have to vote in a direct democracy and decide whether, and, and I don't say this lightly, whether a fair amount of money out of their pocket is worth the investment in the children for the next 5, 10, 15, or 20 years. Um, we have seen just incredible, and it doesn't show up on tests, but growth with our students in using computers. Every single student takes their computer home at night, well, second grade and above. Um, the others, we like to keep at school for some obvious reasons. but. Um, if I could have a nickel for every student that said this was their first computer, but even more importantly, for every family that could barely afford it, who put $10 a month in the internet, I think, I think this is an opportunity to match the investment of all of those families that put 120 bucks a year into their child's education directly for us to do that. And by the way, um, as a taxpayer and property owner in this community, it's also a tax write-off, one of the few that are available. So when you look at the money, it's, it's, it's a fair amount. In the past, every single bond that's been placed before the community has been voted positively by a majority. The state requires a 55% vote, and our polling suggests it would be much higher. So I have to say, as superintendent, I sincerely hope that you give the voters a chance and um, give me a chance to work um, a hole in the shoe leather in my shoes to try to get these things passed and walk door to door. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deshawn. Any questions or comments from the board? Well, what we're talking about okay. facilities. Okay. Um, Dr. Hansen, you mentioned we have the opportunity for four bonds every two years. So are those the four are those four, would those four bonds be approved with this measure? There are issuances, so this, this measure, it's, it, it would take four issuances to, util, to eat up um, the money that Okay, but appro would approving it now right. will yes. authorize those at those intervals. Okay, um, I've been thinking about this and I was thinking it's too bad we don't have alumni associations like UCLA or USC that can, can help fund us with these things. Um, and I realize there are virtually zero capital campaign grants available. Is there any other source of funding that schools can use for this building other, th other than what you mentioned, the match by the state? Yes, the, the other um, leg of the stool, so to speak, are developer fees or, uh, right. in our instance, community facilities districts um, dollars. But so those, those are, are going to be minimal and drying up for our exactly. area, right? It's, it's very small, and, and it also it applies to the area that the, the development is in. So if there's a need in another uh, portion of the district, we can't necessarily access those dollars for that particular school if the development or the dollars coming in for that development aren't there. Okay. I realize there are going to be many competing bond uh, proposals, including uh, the college district, but I think that spending the money at an early age in the student's development, uh, especially if they're not going to go to college, this is really where we need to spend the money to make the impact that's going to make a, a huge change in the angle of their trajectory of success. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I have, a, I have a question. For the community meetings, um, for future meetings, do we plan to meet with any health agencies in our community? We haven't considered that in the past, but we certainly could. Especially now that we have here yeah, down the street, right here, yeah. I, I think it would be. We actually suitable. were thinking of reaching out to them to utilize their facility uh, when we, you know, if we were to to campaign. It's but, yeah. Beautiful, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Ms. Chart? And I just want to comment. I, um, in reading the proposal, it says that um, we have to form a, an oversight committee. Will it be a new committee or will we be using the older one? It will be a new committee. Okay, so anyone terms. that's interested in facilities, Mr. Peterson, um, <laughs> <laughs> might want to join the oversight committee to um, so you can see firsthand what what needs to be done at the schools and to help us um, get this passed. Because over the years, I've lived in this area all my life and I've seen bond issues that were much smaller than this be voted down because they didn't have the cause that this one does. And this cause is for the kids, for the facilities. It's not for salaries. It doesn't raise anybody's salary at all. It's going to make the value of your home and the area you live go up because if you have ever looked to buy a home, the first thing that comes up on your list, on the suggested list by the real estate agents, um, Mr. Anderson pointed this out the other night, is that what are the schools like in your area? And we're already on track to make our schools cho very a good choice for people to move into our area. And with our new homes going in, this is an opportunity for them to see that this is going to be, this, this district is on the move. Um, I think it was Mrs. Roberts who said that we're on the fast train. <laughs> she had bullet train. We're on the bullet train. And um, I, I really think that, that this is where we're going, and I don't think we need to stop now. We need to get it done now because we don't know what the future is going to be like in seven or eight years. And to get this going now and get our bond issue, anyone that's interested in, in trying to get this passed, that's where some of our support is going to come from, not only not with money, but it'll come from the people who want to see this area improve, see your schools improve. When I went to the DAC meeting the other day, I mentioned it to the parents that were there, and all these parents are representatives for their schools and for their school site uh, councils or their PTAs. And I said, what you can do, if you if you are at a school where you don't think it's as nice as Ina Arbuckle or as nice as West Riverside is going to be, then you need to jump on this bandwagon because this is going to help your school improve you're going to your the walls are going to be painted the roofs are going to repair be repaired with this bond issue and i really think that all our facilities that we have done in the past um, with our last bond issue has really really taken taken everybody by storm i mean i really think the parents and the families and the community um, chamber of commerce has honored us because we had the foresight to go out and get a bond issue and get it passed by everybody that lives in this area. It's not just us. Some of some people that are, work for the schools here don't live in this area, but the ones that live in this area, it's going to help you. It's going to benefit your children and your grandchildren, great grandchildren possibly too, because I know these schools have gone for years without repair, the right repair and the proper improvement. You do the same thing to your home. When you want to improve your home, you make repairs. You may not be able to do it all in one time, but you'll do a new roof. Maybe the next year you'll do new flooring or your remodel. So um, think of it that way, that this is your home. This is your child's home. They spend most of their time there and most of their life. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you. A great job, too. Ms. Regal, anything? I have a couple questions. Um, on the issuance, are they going to be the balance of each each year that you have scheduled, so 2021, 23, 25, and 27, is it going to be the same size bond each, or do we have a variance in what the bonds are going to be? We, I think right now they're pretty equal, but depending, we try and take advantage of the market and the interest rates. Like right, We actually, in Measure E, had a four-year issuance plan, and we issued everything in three issuances. So we will take it, and some of the issuances, the middle issuances were larger than the first. So we have the flexibility. We just take advantage of the market at, the, at that point in time. Okay, and I have a couple more questions. Um, I thought on one of our reports several months ago, there was a, on the district needs, the state grants, I thought it was at 50 million. That, that's total district. Um, so this okay, so is you're only not half the schools here, right? Okay. Some of those, some of that 50 or 60 million that we had, uh, we we are starting to access with with the current modernizations. Okay, and then um, obviously what we're asking for is not going to reach the, your full goal here at 355 million. 
are, are we going to pick and choose? Or are we going to look at the oldest schools that need the most improvements? I mean, do you already have a target list of what you're going to recommend? We don't have necessarily a target list at this time when, when we know that it passes and we'd certainly put that together. It'll be a blend, right? Because it's not just modernizations, but we address safety and security. We address career and technical education. We also address technology. So it'll be a blend of, the, of similar projects. Um, and so we would prioritize oldest schools and greatest needs. Uh, those would be decisions that we would bring to the board. And then the safety and the security with the cameras and such, is that even part of this list here so that, or that's completely separate? Some of those costs are built into the modernization, but not fully. So there would be additional uh, monies needed in order to do that. Do you have a target dollar amount of what you're looking at for security? You know, we don't. We've it's still a pretty loaded question. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'm just curious. Okay, that's all I have right now. All right, thanks. Ms. Bradford. With the mass facilities master plan meetings that you did recently, how does that fit into what we're discussing? That, that's a Be because I was really interested in seeing the, the students input to yes. it that, that's a great question because the facility master plan so this this is like a an estimate right we're just taking square footage multiplying it by three hundred fifty dollars which is, is kind of an average cost the facility master plan is going to be much more detailed it'll provide um, those costs and the lifespan of systems and rooftops and all those types of things so we'll be able to drill down even uh, those projects even more specific not only in dollar amount but also uh, priorities and, and based on so we might have a school that's newer but the HVAC units the entire school is going to be be going out within the next um, six to twelve months we know that that may have to move up the list and, and leapfrog over another school or another project because of of that so that's an excellent question the facility master plan works works hand in hand with this uh, it, it's going to provide the detailed planning for us costs um, lifespan of systems all those types of things and I think I pointed it out at the last meeting but you can't access state uh, state dollars without a master plan in place so. Thank you for that question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hansen. I just had one question. So <clears throat> you mentioned that the state facilities bond is not a tax on additional tax. Not an additional tax. So it's state money that's already there somehow. So why do we have to vote on it in, in, in March, the state facilities bond? Do we have to vote on it or is it just, yeah? The, the state, like us, cannot issue debt without voter approval. So what the state does is they take the taxes you already pay. And we have experts that I think can correct me if I'm wrong. But, but it's, in essence, they take the taxes we all pay, and those are primarily income and sales tax. And then they ask people, can we then use a portion of that to indebt the state to pay for? Sometimes it's roads, sometimes it's hospitals, in this case it's schools. So. If that passes, that's going to come out of the state money one way or another. Whether we can access it depends on our ability to match those. Yeah. All right, got it. Yes. Just to follow up on the, on the state bond too, some people might say, well, you know, why don't we kick it down the road? Well, the, the last state bond that passed in 2016, Prop 51, 2018, Prop 51 allocated, uh, I think it was roughly $7 billion to K-12. That quite literally, the day after it passed, those dollars were gone because of all the schools that were lined up for that money and the needs that exist and the, 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 the lifetime between the last state bond. And so to think that $9 billion, if the state bond were to pass, would be available to us in the future is just not, not accurate. Just like we have more needs than we can access dollars for, the state, the school districts in the state are just in the same boat there's more needs than the state can provide grants for. So that those dollars will, will be eaten up very quickly. Where, where do you place us if we were to, were to pass this in March? And then the state bond, if it's gonna be in March or it's gonna be, it's gonna be in March also, right? That's right. Okay, so what is the process for us to get on that? How fast can we get on it? Where will we be way down? Because I know you mentioned the other night that we're in a position now on the last one right so the the program with the new program there, there are changes to the program one of the biggest changes uh, which 
you know, Governor Brown, this started back with Governor Brown, he really didn't like the first in, uh, first out type. He didn't like the, the line process. You know, you get your, your application in, now you're somewhere in line. He wanted to see a more equitable process uh, utilizing needs uh, in districts, uh, demographics, unduplicated counts, rural districts who don't have necessarily have the funds to get applications in and compete for those dollars. So the, pro the, the program will change slightly. Uh, we feel like it will favor us actually because it's based on a point system, uh, at least up to this point. There's not a lot of details. Last time after Prop 51 passed, and you know, once it passes, then the regulations change, right? And then they, they provide those regulations. But the way it looks now is that we could be, it could favor our district because of our unduplicated count and, and the high needs that exist are the old, are the ages of our schools. So um, it'll be a little bit different. I can't answer that question uh, accurately because those regulations haven't been finalized. It'll be a little bit different than just applying and getting in line. But um, we would certainly do it as quickly as possible to make sure that we had access to those dollars and feel confident that we would get uh, our portion. Last year, last time when we passed our bond issue, there were all the school districts around us were doing one also, and almost all of theirs passed also. Do you, have you heard? Are there others that are going for a bond? Because now that it's been announced that this, they're going to put a state bond on uh, the ballot, I haven't heard. Uh, I, obviously, the RC, RCC were aware of that. Right. Um, school districts, I haven't heard specific specific school districts around us, but a lot of them will will try and take advantage of it as well. They're you know we're all in the same boat. Um, right. And they know that those dollars are going to are coveted dollars, right? And we all want access to them. So, if we don't get them, someone else will. And we have the administrators who thought about this way in advance to get us up there, like you guys, <laughs> to get us thinking because we could have waited for a while. But we, I know, we have to have it by a certain date. Which their dead, deadline, I believe, is December first or second, where you have to go on the ballot right. for March. So, we're cutting it close as it is. Right. So, okay. thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Hanson. All right. Um, next item, 5C, open enrollment notification. Mrs. Ford. The district's open enrollment window for the 2020-21 school year is fast approaching, believe it or not. Um, notification of the open enrollment dates are December 2nd, 2019 through January 15th, 2020, and is scheduled to begin next week. So we'll uh, be sending those notifications out through Q Communications, Peach Jar, and uh, Banners. Open enrollment is the time when parents may apply for a 2020-21 school year intra-district transfer, which is a transfer request between schools within the district. Due to um, our current enrollment and our capacity at Del Sol, we will be closed to transfers for the 2020-21 uh, school year for Del Sol. Um, applications are submitted and processed at the Parent Center, and you have a copy of the parent information brochure included in your backup materials. Thank you, Mrs. Ford. Any questions or comments? All right, on to the next item, 5D, CSBA Delegate Assembly nominations. Mr. Deshaun. Thank you, President Garcia. First of all, I might make a side comment that I'm glad to see your name is not on the list of expiring terms. So I'm glad we present this agenda item to you. There are a number of people in Sub-Region 18A and delegate terms expiring in 2020 are Blanca Hall, Marla Kirkland, Susan Lara, David Nielsen, Victor Scavara, and Susan Scott. So um, I believe the board can submit names. I would like to submit them all except Susan Lara because I believe she's not interested in running. So the five remaining names will submit. We need a motion in a second. Yes. Sound good? All right. Let's move on to the next item. We'll go out on those later, I think, so not today. Other administrative reports and written communications. Mr. Deshaun. Yeah, I don't want to take a long time, but I do want to say something. It, it never shows up on the dashboard what happens in an emergency or when a community, particularly a school district, pull through. I don't think it, one of the things that was not mentioned is that when the ambulances rolled up to Patriot High School, 
the Red Cross did not establish their evacuation site there. Um, the ambulances did not bring any way of bringing the patients from the care centers in the Granite Hill area into the center. Our students literally went to the offices and found anything that rolled to bring the, the patients in and take care of them. And it's just amazing to see a community, and particularly a school community, where nobody kind of asks what, what needs to be done. They just kind of do it, and it works together. And to me, that shows a well-oiled machine. And I would love to see something on the state dashboard that just says, well-oiled machine and people that care, because that was clearly shown on those two days. So. Thank you, Mr. Deshaun. Okay, moving on to the action session. Uh, I'd ask the board to please refresh your screens, because we will be voting. Mr. Dabrowski. Yeah, we'd like to remove item number 19. It's a travel request and that trip was canceled. Thank you, Mr. Dabrowski. So we need a motion to approve action, uh, adopt routine action items A1 through A18 and 20 through 37. So moved. Motion by Ms. Ortega. Second, Second by Mrs. Regal. Um, let's call for the vote. Motion passes 5 0. Sometimes you just got to laugh at yourself. <laughs> okay, we're on item B award for award contract for bus cameras, Mrs. Ford. In an effort to improve the safety and security for our students and our bus drivers, administration researched a number of camera options to be able to place into the district's uh, 71 school buses that are currently active school buses. Administration has determined that the system provided by Safety Vision best meets the district's needs. There will be at least three cameras per bus, capturing both interior and exterior angles. And the camera system includes a panic button in the event that there is an emergency, the, the driver can uh, you know, push that button. The contract includes all of the equipment that's required. It also includes a three-year warranty and an on-site and on-site training for the district's mechanics for the installation and maintenance of the cameras. Um, so the mechanics would be shadowing uh, the vendor when, as the vendor does uh, uh, the complete installation of a couple of buses, and then that way they and they will become certified to be able to uh, install, and that way the warranty is um, all intact and remains intact for all the ones that our, drive, our uh, mechanics install. Pricing is based off the Texas Region 8 Education Service Center, which is the TIPS uh, piggyback contract, number 18081. I do have one correction on this item, and it's on the funding source. This project will actually be funded through the district's special reserve for capital outlay and uh, it indicated um, being funded through general fund on your uh, item, but it is through capital, um, uh, special reserve for capital LA. Administration recommends the board make a finding to use um, the TIPS piggyback contract, and it's in the best interest of the district, and award a contract for bus cameras to Safety Vision in the amount of $119,177.72. With a noted correction. To the funding With source, the right? noted correction to the funding source, yes, okay. sir. Move to approve. Motion by Ms. Chard. Second. Second by Ms. Ortega. Any questions or comments? I have a question. Ms. Regal. On the uh, when when would these the installation start? Um, we would have to place the order once the the board has approved. If the board so approves tonight, we will place the order. The lead time, I believe, on this particular vendor was about two to three weeks. We're we're hoping we can actually do some. 
of the training over that Christmas holiday time and that, you know, that break that we have. And how long does it take to install a set of cameras on each bus? Is that a full day process? I would imagine the first two installs as they're shadowing would be like a full day process. Um, and then after that, I think it will just depend on, on how quickly, you know, they're able to do it. But I would imagine it's going to take a few hours to install all the cameras on a bus. Okay, one more question. Sorry. Sure. So if the, if the camera fails or something that, you know, there's an object blocking the camera lens, mm -hmm. is it going to alert anybody or is it going to kind of just keep rolling and nobody's going to know that it's not capturing right. anything? So the drivers are able to see like a little preview of the cam of what is happening with the camera. So if somebody puts something over it, they'll be able to know that that's happening. It'll be blank. Um, there's also an alert system for any failure of a camera. So they'll get an alert that there's a camera, whichever camera number it is, camera number one is failing. And how long is that warranty to service these cameras if the something fails? Well, it's a three year warranty. Will someone be monitoring all of the buses from a main location or will these just be monitored by the bus drivers? These are, so it's actually, the, everything is recorded to a card inside the, the bus itself. And so um, it won't be monitored outside of that. It would actually have to be taken, uh, the card would have to be taken out and played in, in the system to be able to see what actually happened on the bus. Okay, so if somebody left something on the bus or whatever, or a exactly. child was still on the bus when they pulled in and had, was hiding or something, it wouldn't necessarily alert anyone to that. Right, this isn't like a live monitoring okay. situation. This is more of, um, uh, if an event happens on the bus and then we need to look back at the cameras to see what happened, we would be able to go to, back to that time um, element on the camera and be, uh, for that particular bus and identify what exactly happened and review the video. So there's not a main place. It would have to be each individual bus that we would have to review yeah. the camera yes. for that. Okay. Yes, and, and again, it would be an alert. It would be basically a, a driver telling us that they saw this happen someone else telling us they saw this happen and then we would go back and view that video on that bus. Does this fall under safety of the children? I mean, is this mm -hmm. mainly what it's for is to prevent things yeah. from happening on the bus? That it is, and, and we'll, we'll also we'll have some external cameras, so we'll be able to see if we have unsafe cars, drivers, drivers around the bus, so right. we'll be able to capture that as well. Thank you. Mr. Ortega? Um, I, I just thought about one question. Uh, legally, we can record students or is there a waiver they need to sign or anything like that legal, legally? Um, we can record both audio and video. Um, it, um, the audio we have to ensure that we have notifications posted and we send notifications to all parents. Any other questions? Yes, it includes both audio and video. Um, the audio can be um, turned off and deactivated if necessary. Mr. Bradford, if I could please ask you not to do that. And maybe if you need to know additional, um, you can check with Mrs. Ford afterwards. So, thank you. One other question I have, um, Mrs. Ford is, um, actually maybe it's just a comment. So um, Mrs. Chard mentioned about students uh, being left on the bus. So we have other, other ways uh, like maybe fail safe other ways that we can determine that, right? Yes, uh, by law we have to have uh, a system that's called, it's actually one system that was approved by the uh, CHP in California and that's the child checkmate system. So by law we have to have that system installed on all our buses and we do have that. We installed those last, last year. Okay, any other questions or comments? We have a first and a second, right? Okay, let's call for the vote, please. Motion passes 5-0. Item C. Adopt a second reading, ordinance 2020-01, ordinance of the Board of Education for the Hoop Unified School District, 
acting as the legislative body of Community Facilities District Number 19 of the Harupa Unified School District, authorizing the levy of a special tax. Mrs. Ford. Thank you. And this is a final step in the formation process of CFD Number 19, which you um, acted on last uh, board meeting. The board is to conduct a second reading of the ordinance number two uh, number 2020 slash zero one which provides for the levy of special taxes within the cfd 19 boundary in order to finance facility needs the special tax rate will be set each year based on the formulas that are in the rate um, and method of apportionment for cfd number 19. administration recommends the board adopt us at a second reading ordinance number 2020 slash zero one ordinance of the board of education for the Roop unified school district acting as the legislative body of community facilities district number 19 of the Harupi Unified School District authorizing the levy of a special tax. It's a lot. It's a lot. Lots to say. Um, thank you, Mrs. Ford. So moved. Motion by Mr. Ortega. Second. Second by Mrs. Regal. Any questions or comments? All right. Let's call for the vote, please. Motion passes 5-0. Item D, adopt resolution number 2020-16, approving and authorizing execution of a joint community facilities agreement. Mrs. Ford. In 2018, the board actually approved the formation of CFD number 14, which is located north of the 60 uh, freeway and east of Armstrong. Uh, Certain property that was in that CFD has now been annexed or has, has been determined to be annexed into the Riverside Community Services District, requiring that we approve and authorize uh, the joint community facilities ag agreement between the two agencies, between Harupa Unified and River Riverside Community Services District. Administration recommends the board adopt resolution number 2020-16, approving and authorizing execution of joint community facilities agreement. Thank you, Mrs. Ford. Move to approve. Motion by Mrs. Chard. Second. Second by Mrs. Ortega. Any questions or comments? All right, let's call for the vote, please. Motion passes 5-0. Item E, adopt resolution number 2020-17, resolution of the Board of Education of Harupa Unified School District, ordering an election to authorize the issuance of general obligation, general obligation, <laughs> obligation bonds, establishing specifications of the election order and requesting consolidation with other elections occurring on March 3rd, 2020. Mrs. Ford. So uh, resolution number 2020-17 calls an election under the provision of Proposition 39 for the purpose of approving school bonds in an aggregate amount not to exceed the amount determined by the board, which is currently 192 million. The resolution also requests the County of Riverside Register of Voters conduct the election on behalf of the district, submit a ballot measure, a project list, and form of tax rate statement, and authorizes the preparation of ballot arguments to be included in the ballot pamphlet. Under state law, the board has the authority to call elections of district general obligation bonds. The resolution includes the full bond measure the related project list, the 75 word ballot measure, and the tax rate statement. If any board member so chooses, he or she is authorized to execute an argument in favor of the ballot measure. The election will be called under the provisions of Proposition 39 and California Ed Code 15264, whereby permitting the approval of the ballot measure with a vote of at least 55% of the electors voting and requires the appointment of a citizens oversight committee and annual financial and performance audits. At least four members of the board must uh, vote in favor of calling the election. 
If the resolution is adopted, original executed copies of the resolution and tax statement must be delivered to the Registrar and the County Board of Supervisors no later than December 5th, 2019. And then I just wanted to, you know, reiterate, you know, as Dr. Hansen stated that, you know, we have a number of schools that are eligible and in need of modernization. And we, we need a school facility bond in order to continue that program. We, we do not have funding of any other source that would be of that magnitude to be able to perform um, those functions and, and be able to uh, provide for those facilities needs that we have and also to continue our Chromebook, our one-to-one -one Chromebook program. And that's something that I believe um, in both cases, what we've seen uh, Dr. Hansen and his team do with our facilities in the last uh, several years, in addition to what we've been able to do with the one-to-one -one Chromebooks, I think we, we have a very, very successful program. And, and again, the district must have matching facility funds to be able to take advantage of the state bond and um, it's the opportunity to, to, be, to go right along with the state bond. You know, we'll be right there in front, you know, being able to uh, put our projects in line, you know, for that funding. So um, again, uh, you know, 200, uh, the, av or the median home price is 234,000 in Arupa. That's approximately, you know, $98.58 per household for that median home. We know that we have half that are lower than that, we, that are in the district. We have half of the homes that are higher assessed value in the, in, in the district. But um, it's, it, it may, it, I know it's not easy for some families, but at the same time, I know that we have families out there that, ha, that give and give every day to Harupa Unified because they believe the education of their child is so, so important, so critical. So with that, um, administration, administration recommends the board adopt resolution number 2020-17, resolution of the Board of Education of Harupa Unified School District, ordering an election to authorize the issuance of general obligation bonds, establishing specifications of the election order, and requesting consolidation with other elections occurring on March 3rd, 2020. Thank you, Mrs. Ford. Move to approve. Motion by Mrs. Chard. Second by Ms. Ortega. Questions? I have two quick questions. Ms. Chard. Um, when, we pre pre uh, when we prepared this and we're analyzing it, do we include the new housing tracks that are going in around us? Or do those kind of fall into that category as to the amount that we wanted to go for or a bond for a bond? Or did we, yeah. why didn't we go more if we needed more money? So, um, so our, our team, um, <laughs> they um, actually look at the assessed value that is available currently, as well as the ability to look at going forward in years, how much additional assessed value we would be able to access. So it, it does include you know, what is available, but it doesn't necessarily include homes that aren't built at this time because we can't guarantee that those homes will ever be built. Okay. We want to be more on the conservative um, so that we can make sure that we can access that full 192 million. Okay. And that's what we want to make sure that we're able to do. If we go out to the voters for that, we want to be able to make sure we can access that, those funds. Okay. Did you say 492 million? 192 million. Okay, I thought I heard a four. I was like, <laughs> no four. Mrs. We need Chard. That much. We need that much. Mrs. Chard, would you like to have Rachel give some a better summary or anything? If, if you want to say something that you've spent all your time here and answer yeah. the question, but. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Do you have another question, Mrs. Chard? Is it? It was in. It was okay. In Mr. Riggle, do you have something? Or? So if we look at the 100, now I forgot, um, 100, 192 92 million. million, and it, according to this report, we're at 355. Is there a target of the next time that we're going to need to request a bond from our residents? Conditions always change. So um, just to kind of put it in a little bit of historical perspective, we had about 100 and I believe 20 million 
in Measure C, and half of that went to Patriot High School. So a lot of it depends on the availability of school funding, the cost of materials, the cost of contracts, the availability of school deferred maintenance money, what we can accomplish inside. This is a pretty comprehensive number. We have always aspired to, f to fill in all the dots for that number. We'll, we'll probably never get there. So we can't really project when the next time would be. Obviously, we don't want to hit voters every other year with a bond. We want to be very aware that they have needs and, and that our taxpayers want their money to be spent judiciously. So I, I can't say we, I can't say never, but sometime there might be a need to do it again. And I just want to add to uh, the school communities first that Wendy brought up earlier, uh, the split roll tax thing with CSBA, uh, which it's all kind of Prop 13 reform. Um, you know, all that could change things, you know. Right now, I think we're sitting at 39th, 39th, I think, in the country for per pupil funding here in California. So there are a lot of efforts there. So there may be some changes, too, just for ongoing funds if we can get there. So. And this vote is just to take it to the ballot. That's correct. Yes. To allow the, the, the yeah. community to decide. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you cannot levy a tax. Ms. Bradford, do you have a question or comment? I'd like to sh share with the audience a couple of comments that I've heard at the ribbon cutting of Del Sol Academy, how beautiful it was. I heard a, a teacher from uh, one of the middle schools just sighing and saying, I wish we had this. And I think about the day that we had the um, um, open house of the Innovation Center and how we had Tesla there as a, a relationship that we are building because of that innovation. I think we never would have attracted the attention of Tesla, nor I think about Gordon Bournes, whom I know personally. His company's products are involved in products from your cell phones to avionics in jetliners and to have this kind of attention directed at our district for the benefit of our students learning and those relationships in place for access to, to these kinds of forward thinking minds, I think we really need to have the facilities upgrades that we've been listening to. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I just wanted to say, uh, just looking at the survey results, I think they were very positive. Um, again, we're going to ask the voters to, to decide to tax themselves or not. Uh, I mean, I support that. I think, uh, you know, I don't think you can say you support uh, students in their education if you don't support uh, their facilities. So it's very important. And then there's also independent uh, citizens uh, oversight committee. So. Um, so we have somebody kind of keeping an eye. So I feel very confident um, passing this over to to the voters, and I'm going to vote yes on this. So, any other questions or comments? Okay, let's call for the vote, please. Motion passes, 5-0. All right, final, final uh, uh, item, item F, board member committee reports. Mrs. Regal, start with you. Okay, that was done and over with. Um, I wanna thank you all for your support in discussing that bond. Um, I was very clear on how I felt about it and, and it's, um, I'm gonna sleep tonight, and it's, it means a lot. It's emotionally um, relieving, but I think some of you suspected of how I was gonna vote, and I, I had addressed a lot of concerns. It is a lot of money, and, and Dr. Hansen, like you taking me out there to show me some of those campuses, I can't, the kids 
and, and they deserve that environment. And those neighborhoods driving through there, I, I can't tell you that was the first thing I noticed driving down the street to Ina Arbuckle. I said, look at the street. It, it's completely improved and, um, and not necessarily even the retention. And we're talking about losing you know, students to other districts. And as we said, it, it's happening across the state. It's not just our district. But our students, um, they can't vote. They can't tell us what they want. And I, I'm sure the teachers would agree that they want to be in an environment that looks like it's refreshed and in some of those facilities in the bathrooms. I mean, they look like when I was a child going to school, they have not been updated. Um, but I want to support this. I, I'm not going to sugarcoat it and tell you that I'm, I, I don't like the cost of it, but we do need this within our district. So, you know, thank you all for your patience and, and helping me. Um, or guide me through all of the information that I really needed. Thank you, Mrs. Riegel. Mrs. Chard. Um, thank you, Mrs. Riegel, for being honest about that. It's, it's really hard when you think about it, it's going to affect your life and it's going to affect you as a person, but it depends on how you look at it too. In the long run, if you forget, if you don't go through Starbucks, one week out of the month or something like that, or one day out of the year, two or three days, you know, it'll add up to where you're not gonna miss this, you're not even going to see it. But it's the fact that you've contributed something to your community by voting this in. Um, and I totally agree, when you see the area that has been improved, once Ina was, re was done, the people started saying, hey, I'm gonna fix my house up because I know driving back and down through there before Ina was finished, those people had not done some of those things that they're doing to their homes. And some of those have lived there all their lives. So they know what the beautification can do for the community, make their house more valuable if they wanted to sell it. So, um, but to me, it's where our teachers will feel more comfortable, our students will feel more comfortable. And as we prepare for the future and how we want to have our classes operate, we're getting away from the desk only situation. We're coming into the, and I can't remember what it's called, someone help me. Makerspace. Makerspaces, um, things like that. Your classrooms that are more relaxed because kids do a lot better when they're in a, in a place where they feel comfortable. And I know that the, the children at Del Sol really like their school. And if I were to take my granddaughters over there, they'd go, I want to go here. <laughs> not that their school is that bad. It's not that bad. But it's just the fact that it's, they're looking to the future. They're seeing all these movies about the future and they want to be in the future. And if we can put them there while they're still in elementary school, we're going to have a great country in a few years when all of them are out and they're making things so much better, so much faster with so, much, so many smarter people. And our district is on that on that bullet train with those kids, so we don't want to put a stop anywhere. That's all I have to say. Oh, and my next EAC meeting is not until January, and they will be introducing the um, LCAP. They'll be discussing the LCAP, which uh, was given to the parents the other day. So they have an opportunity to see where, where our money goes, and this will help them with the ballot issue, I think. If they really read it, they'll understand that we have to have all this money, but it's not going to come out of there. So that money is going to be just for buildings, and our LCAP has to come from our other funding that we have, correct? Am I correct on that? So this is like a, a gift. If we put it in a gift to the district that says, we want you to fix our schools. Don't worry about the teachers or anybody else. We'll worry about that stuff. This is just for our schools. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Chard. Mrs. Bradford. I'm so irritated with myself because I walked out of the house without the beautiful little hand-drawn cards that students from Dan Oldgeen's fourth grade class at Camino Real wrote to me after I read uh, one of my own stories to them a couple of weeks ago. I think about them as we've discussed the passage of the bond, proposing the bond, because of the way that Mr. Oldgeen refers to his students as superheroes of Room 25 and he calls them scholars. And I think that, what's the expression? People rise up to your ex or 
decrease to your expectation of them. So I think given these innovations in technology, the improved facilities, and, and teachers like those I've described and we've seen here, I think we're in fine hands for our students' future, and thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Bradford. Ms. Ortega. Thank you. In, um, in the season of, of giving thanks, I think um, I'm extremely grateful for education and the investment that all of us are making in education. There's parts in, the, in our world where education is not valued, and not every kid and not every community has the ability and the right to go to school and have an, a free education. So I think um, just what we did right now is, is, is a call and a voice to those that we owe it to. And I think it's those kids that they deserve to be in safer schools. And um, I admire our superintendent, um, Dushan, and also in the Riverside County, Dr. White, that was one of the first things that she, when she um, stepped in, into office, she said, I want to create a program, uh, the, the Adopt a School Program, and it's an initiative where she's, you know, she's encouraging community leaders to really adopt the school, and I don't think that's just what she's doing. She's actually encouraging individuals to invest in education. And just to read you, th this is what comes out on the, on the website. It says, Adopt a School Program, the Riverside County Office of Education. Adopt a School Program is an initiative developed for a purpose of building long-term partnerships between schools and local community organizations. Creating strong relationships will enhance student experiences while creating exposure to businesses. So again, that community uh, spirit that all of us are in it for the well-being and the the welfare of, of students and um, I'm just very very um, proud to to say that we took that step to, to allow our, our community members to vote um, you know in a very important um, matter of investing in, in education where again not everybody in the world has has that ability um, and also uh, in hence of, of uh, the, the gratitude spirit, the cards that we got from Indian Hill uh, students is just really like if we need any confirmation is that that we are doing a great job. It's students looking at the work that we leaders are doing and that that is my paycheck. That is what I do. That is what brings me to 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 this seat, and you know, and encouraging me every day to do just that little letter. Um, I keep in my heart for forever, um, and just wanted to wish all of you a very happy Thanksgiving, and um, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ortega. I, I just have a couple of things. Um, first of all, I thank thank the board for for having the courage and, and vision to say let's. Make this thing work and make it happen, and let's get let's get it out to the voters. Uh, but I really wanted to focus on this this, this, this thing here, the um, group of US, the USD JUSD holiday food drive. Um, and as the, as my colleagues up here have been talking about our students and um, how great our students are, um, most of the volunteers at this are students, probably. At least 300 out of the 400, maybe there's 400 volunteers on Friday. At least 300 of them are students anywhere from middle school all the way to high school. And they not only collect canned goods, either bring them in, uh, but they also come out on, on that Friday and they help uh, sort. And it's, it's really, really organized these days. Um, and as, as Laura mentioned earlier, the Lions Club feeds them, and so we feed them 400 potatoes. And within like, we pass them out within like 20 minutes. And they're all eating together, and they, and they come back the next day. Some of them come back the next day, and um, and it's really a rewarding uh, thing to do. If you haven't done it, uh, you really should. Uh, one year, my son, when he was a senior, he, one of his friends, friends with him was George. <clears throat> I think they were juniors. They were working together, and George, says he found this this gun that was um, like a little space gun or something that that he wanted for his little brother because his little brother and his family were going to be recipients. Yeah, he, George was there volunteering his time, even though his family was, was going to be recipients. So unfortunately, 
George's little brother didn't get the gun because he didn't hide it good enough. But um, just show that these students, they really care about each other. Uh, and as I mentioned in the past, student youth court and those kinds of things. When students, um, when they look at each other, they don't necessarily look at, they, they really respect each other. And when it comes to discipline, they don't look at it the same way we do, where we, we tend to want to punish first. So um, that's all I wanted to say. And one thing I did notice this week on uh, JUSD Horizon, I think, or somewhere, the Bitter group that had gone out with uh, some housing construction company. And I thought that's really great. And um, that we're getting, that our students are actually learning uh, real, real, world, real world stuff. So any final comments, Mr. Deshaun? Yeah, I do actually three, so I'm sorry. I'll apologize ahead of time. Um, most of you, I'm sure, do not remember 1975 when the federal government passed 94-142. Before that time, we were not required to serve students with disabilities in any way different from any other students. It was a major sea change in how we served disabled students. At the time, I worked in a psych hospital those students were not provided a free and appropriate public education. Fast forward to 2015, the state came up with a plan to implement federal guidelines on how to include students in general education classes. I looked at it and I thought this is gonna be impossible. I, I hate to admit it, I did not embrace it immediately. Um, it took a while and we have been working with it since. I, I am well aware that it is very difficult for all of us, our teachers included, to address the needs of some of our students with the greatest needs, our students with disabilities. But the result has paid off incredibly, and I think the greatest opportunity for our students with disabilities is an inclusion, and the opportunity to be in classes with where they're with general ed teachers. I recognize that it requires immense resources, and I want to applaud NEAJ on its collaboration with us on inclusion committees, as well as changes in the discipline laws in California. We all know they're very difficult. So um, Ms. Eccles, as president of NEAJ, I want to thank you and your members for working with us on these two very, very difficult issues. I believe we can solve them. Lastly, I want to thank the board. I know for each of you, um, it was a different kind of struggle to come to whether we were going to put a measure on the bond or not. Um, it's a, a covenant between you and your constituents, you and your community, and you and your own hearts. Um, I know it's difficult to say that we support taking more money out of people's pockets, but in reality, it's their choice, and I applaud you. I also thank you for your due diligence, each and every one of you, for asking the questions and going through the decision making. This is what boards of, of education are for and why we have them. You are the place where public education meets democracy in the local community. So I can't thank you more. I can't tell you how much it means to me personally as a member of the community. Having sat as a parent in many of our schools that needed upgrades and we're still working on. It is, as Mrs. Regal kind of pointed out, a never-ending thing. Sometimes we're, we're on that wheel and we keep turning and turning, but this is our best opportunity to at least allow the community to, to decide. So I applaud each of you and thank you from the bottom of my heart for your d decision tonight. Thank you, Mr. Deshaun. I do have one final comment. And I, uh, sometimes I know uh, the public um, teachers uh, maybe sometimes they feel like we're, we're not paying attention up here uh, whether it's inclusion or any other thing. But nothing could be further from the truth. We, um, I serve on the Delegate Assembly for California School Boards and this year in May we had the focus of that was special ed and inclusion and those types of things. And so and I know sometimes <clears throat> teachers may not, not see that extra work that we do and not just myself, my colleagues here. Um, that we do go out and I think I saw Wendy this weekend we were at a convention and we uh, see some um, the, the school communities thing and so those are the big picture things that, that we all work on together and bigger picture 
and not so much in the weeds and really trying to, um, but we're really trying to, to work with the legislature and, and get more funding and uh, get those challenges out there. Um, just to, I want to mention this, I may probably mentioned it before, but for special ed in, the, in last year's budget, I think we had $35 million that we spent. $25 million of it came out of the general fund. So, um, and those are like unfunded mandates that we have to spend that whether the federal government doesn't provide to IDEA, I think is what you're talking about. Um, and the state's not so much delinquent as the federal government, but but still that's, that's money that we have to, to scrape together. And um, so we do a best job we can as a governance team here to to work with some of those inclusion programs. And I you know, would ask that, you know, teachers alike would, would you know, embrace that, that uh, committee type of uh, path forward. Uh, so that's all I have for this evening. And I thank everyone for staying up so late and meeting adjourned.